All right, hello everyone, and welcome to another uh, TV Party Tonight Extra Boxing Commentary. Tonight we have Deontay Wilder, the WBC Heavyweight Champion, versus arch rival of sorts, Dominic Brazil. And joining me tonight, he's drunk as a skunk, and he got the funk. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boxing expert extraordinaire, Mr. Toxic Masculinity, good to his mother, Pat Mullen. How do you do, sir? Uh, it's not my name. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Uh, I changed it to uh, Terry Ferguson. It's a funny name. <laughs> How much have you had to drink tonight, sir? A lot of Coors Banquet. Why Coors Banquet, just out of curiosity? Has anyone been watching Cobra Kai? Ah, okay. That, that's what that... Those, oh, I, I figured it wasn't like the, whatever the Jamaican one is, but that's what. It, but that small bottle, that's, that's what it reminded me of. That's what it looked like. Red Stripe? That's the one. Yeah, Red Stripe's good stuff, too. I've had a Red Stripe or two in my time. Hey, so earlier on the undercard tonight, we had Gary Russell Jr., Literally dress his entourage as spear chuckers, and I, now we've got Beyonce Wilder uh, with guys <laughs> in gas masks who look emaciated, making fun of the Holocaust. Mark, how do you feel about that? Uh, I, I prefer to look at him as more Ming the Merciless. This is kind of the Undertaker uh, during his devil worshiping phase when he was the cult leader. That's kind of what this reminds me of. I think he looks like Chris Bosch. <laughs> you know, the more I think about it, the more... I enjoy the Deontay Wilder fights because they're awful, and I like awful things. But the more I think about it, the more I'm with you, that this guy is a fraud until he fights Anthony Joshua. If after the Anthony Joshua fight on June 1st, these two don't lock horns, I don't know, I might have to start tweeting Deontay Wilder, quit running, bitch. Yeah, his name is uh, Beyonce Wilder. <laughs> Beyonce Wilder, okay. And uh, I'd like to thank Shannon the Cannon Briggs for uh, coining that one. So let's talk turkey as best we can. I, I, I know that given, uh, given the fight and your current state of mind, you know, it's kind of a hmm-hmm, well, hmm-hmm. But... Let, let's I see honestly what, don't know what you mean by my current state of mind, but that's fine. <laughs> let's see what we can do as far as uh, a analysis. Uh, how do you like how do you like your Dominic Brazil? Sunny side up? What do you think uh, going into this fight? So I've seen very limited Dominic Brazil. Um, the, mainly the one fight I can tell you I did see him in was against Anthony Joshua. And he was stopped in the seventh round of that fight. Um, I, and he has gone on to say he doesn't feel he fought his best fight in that one, which I, I wouldn't disagree with. I saw him fight Amir Mansoor, who was this knockout artist, and he beat him up fairly well. But he doesn't have a lot of names on his uh, uh, his record there that ones would recognize. You know, a uh, decision over Nagy Aguilera, who's a journeyman, uh, knockout over Billy Zumbrun, who I think some people have seen fight on FS1 cards. But there's nobody else on there that would really give you an indication of his real talent level. Uh, you know, 18, you know, 18 knockouts and 20 wins. Joshua stands as his only defeat. Uh, as an amateur, he went to the London Olympic Games, but didn't medal. He got beat in the first round. Uh, we'll see. His plan tonight, according to what he said to his Showtime interviewers, was that he uh, feels that uh, he needs to back Wilder up and work the body a lot. Uh, I don't know that that's the right move, but we'll see. Well, Deontay Wilder, one thing positive you can say about him is he's got some pretty crazy reach. He didn't really use that to his advantage in the Tyson Fury fight, but then again, you know, as you put it at the time, Tyson Fury is such a herky-jerky, unpredictable style. Uh, I don't know how much... I, I don't know how much better use he could have made of his reach. Uh, going into this one, do you see that being a factor? Sure, because if you don't want to get hit with his best shot, you either have to be outside of his reach or inside that reach just enough where he can't club you with his right hand, which is really his weapon. 
uh, of choice. For Brazil, though, I think if he really wants to have success, because he claimed he saw that during the Fury fight, what he needs to do is he needs to get Wilder to set to throw that right hand, and as soon as Wilder sets, just move away from him. And then pop him and move, pop him and move, because Wilder can't deal with that. Wilder doesn't know what to do if you don't stand still for him to throw his right hand. What do you make of Wilder when he does that clubbing uh, that he does, where he doesn't necessarily throw a punch, he almost he uh, he does like almost like a palm strike. Yeah, it's technically illegal to do that, so he's gotten away with it. He does it want a, He does it a lot. Like I was watching some of the highlights, and I I understand to you know maybe to the untrained eye to the average uh, viewer, these just look like he's killing guys. He's just knocking bitches out left and right. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, he's dropping bombs. But I, I watched it closely, and I'm like, yeah, you're not punching. You're clubbing with the palm of your fist, palm of your hand. Right, where there is no padding on the glove. Mm-hmm. So, essentially, this is uh, another Canelo situation where they're just letting him get away with murder because Showtime is pretty much trying to continue to build their, their boxing off of him. Because for some reason, they think that having an American heavyweight champion is better than having not an American heavyweight champion. But let's just go this route. Has he gotten more mainstream media coverage than Lennox Lewis did? Uh, I don't know. Has he? No, he hasn't. Occasionally, he'll pop up on a blip on Showtime. Or excuse me, not Showtime. CBS, who is the parent uh, network of Showtime. Um, very rarely do you see him pop up on ESPN, which uh, he uh, Lennox Lewis was on routinely. I think Lennox Lewis is more well known also than Wilder. America, so. <laughs> well, I, again, I think the idea is for years now they've been searching for that next Mike Tyson, that next crossover heavyweight boxing star, and they think they've got it in this guy. I mean, he certainly has. Some pizzazz, as uh, Jim well, Norton would say. You ever, you ever listen to Mike Tyson speak? You know what uh, the obvious part of his voice. Right. He has that odd pitch tenor to his voice. That this bruising mountain of muscle of a man way back has this high pitched, you know, sensitive voice. You ever listen to Deontay Wilder talk? <laughs> Deontay, Deontay Wilder talks like he's part of the, like he was part of the Wu Tang Clan. Tyson could actually be articulate and use big words correctly. Deontay Wilder gets mush mouth status if he has to use a word. <laughs> yeah, look, three syllable words are not his friend. Uh, we just Two lost. syllable words are barely his friend. That, of course, is the dulcet tones of the Howard Lederman of this three man booth. And not just because. Well, he's, Mark! And not just because he's dead inside. Get it? Because Howard Lederman just died. Get it? I'm only, I'm only mostly dead inside. Come on. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Billy William. Billy shit. Crystal. Thank you, thank you, Billy Crystal. All right, we are ready to start this fight here. We want to welcome Robert Winfrey uh, to the booth, and we are underway. Rob, as this as this fight gets started, we've heard Pat's analysis. Uh, I know you're not a huge fan of Deontay Wilder. I'm actually surprised you joined us it's tonight. It's Beyonce, Mark. Beyonce Wilder. <laughs> Beyonce Wilder. Sorry. I'll get it right one of these days. Uh, give, me, give me your 50 words or less on this fight, sir. I mean, it's a Deontay Wilder fight. It's a clown fiesta. You watch, the, you watch his fights for the comic value, not for the fight value. I was just saying to Pat, I, and, I, and I just noticed it tonight, even though I've watched a number of his fights, that he actually like clubs with the with the palm of his. Uh, his You're his just hand. now realizing this. I've never watched it that closely. God, he's fucking terrible. <laughs> <laughs> his punching for a guy who has been around boxing as long as he has, he relies on nothing but power. His technique is awful. Yeah, he no, it really is. Forty fights, and he fucking lunges in with his hands down for a body shot. He's the fucking worst. So I watch this, and I watch my son mess with his speed bag, and I'm like, all right, you know what? At, at, at best, he's as good as Deontay Wilder at this point. 
<laughs> he can only get better. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if he doesn't, if he doesn't train any more a day in his life, he's at least as good as the heavyweight as the WBC oh, look, heavyweight champion. Deontay Wilder got hit when he was trying to hit somebody. What a <laughs> shot! He landed one. He landed one palm strike, and uh, or shote, and <laughs> he backed up Brazil, who tucked his chin. Winged the nonsensical right hand, then it landed right on Wilder's chin and backed him off. So, folks, can if you, you... Just, I mean, look, we've talked a little bit about this, but can you seriously imagine the the just drubbing that Anthony Joshua? Oh would off shit! The and we have a knocked knockdown in the he first round. Uh, there it is. Yeah, I no, he's getting up. Let's see if he makes a ten count. Nope, we're done. First round KO. Well, this was a short night, folks. That was a dive. You think yeah, so? Yeah, kind of. Well, let me put it like this: he could have got, he could have beaten that count if he wanted to. Uh, I think he just like, all right, I'll take the payday and I'll take the extra money in the, I'll take the extra cash in the back for not making Deontay Wilder look like more of a fool than Deontay Wilder makes himself look like. So let me, so, he so let me, so bad. <laughs> let me ask you a direct question here: going into the fight, do you think? He he was go- going in, taking a dive, or what? Once he got knocked down, it was more like, well, since I'm already on the canvas, let me just make this a short night. No, no, he that the before, like look at this guy. Look at the way. Watch the replay of this. Like watch. He's not fighting like a man who really wants to win the fight. He's fighting like a guy who's like, all right, I'm just gonna try and go back, make it go look kind of good. Go back to that point in the fight where Wilder threw that fucking stupid left hook. And he gets cracked. Yeah, I mean, look, he clinches right away to give Wilder time to recompose. He's like, oh, God, sorry, man. I know I'm not supposed to hit you that hard. Then you look at the following series where he jabs three times and Wilder immediately backs up to the ropes with his earmuffs on. And Brazil then circles into the corner. How does that make any sense? Hey, real it quick. It really quick, doesn't. Real quick, Rob. Who won? RDA or... Um, RDA Kevin? got the tap, son. Did Dos Anjos with that fourth round arm triangle. Dude, Dos Anjos is legitimately great. Well, I turned it off at the, almost the beginning of the fourth round because I needed to get boxing on. So, was it fourth or fifth round that he tapped him out? Fourth. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, it was a significantly better fight than this one, and it spent the majority of its time in the clinch. And it was oh, probably oh. real. True. <laughs> right, well, look, I, look, Kevin Lee and RDA are two... There, there's guys in the UFC who I imagine, like, under the right circumstances would take a dive. I don't think either of those two are that guy. I'm waiting for a replay here. I want to see what dropped him. Oh, it was oh. a straight right. It was a hard punch. Yeah. It, was, it was a right hand over the non-existent left hand. God, how do you how do you suck so badly against Deontay Wilder that your defense is all right? I'm going to keep my lead hand at my waist. Like the man only has power hooks. You this got... was so short. Their replay starts at the beginning of the fight. It's less than a round. It's less than two minutes, I think. Yeah. Like, look how terrible this is. It's just the like I've seen like, better. I've seen better technicians like fight. While getting peanuts thrown at them with no television cameras, so he's not really jabbing. He's just kind of sticking his arm out there, and he drops his right hand every time he does it. <laughs> it's so bad. Again, like, can you just imagine the absolute drubbing Anthony Joshua would put on this guy? There's like, a reason Wilder won't fight him. How is this guy called a heavyweight champion by anybody? He's a fucking clown. Look, see right there. Okay, three jabs, and what does he do? He circles into the corner. Walks into the corner with yeah, his hands down. He's giving Wilder time to recover. This looks like a fake fight. Or a fixed fight rather than fake. Because, that, again, that's a clean punch that drops him. But it looks fixed. So in the replay there, he just scored a left hook. Yeah, it was a slapping hook. There was no weight on it. Okay, straight right there. And it's still got Wilder to back off. I question his chin. <laughs> okay, so Wilder's got him in the corner now. He's just winging hooks at him. Wow, this is fucking ugly. This is like Rocky ugly. It's uglier than Rocky. Rocky looks at this guy and goes, you yeah. know, I can show you a thing or two. Yeah, and then he got caught, 
which he wasn't supposed to, because Brazil literally ducked his head, wasn't even looking at where he was throwing, and still hit him with the right hand. Wow, it's so oh. funny. He got nailed there and got and was like punch drunk walking off the ropes before like the ref was like, "Calm down." Yeah, like again, Brazil falls into that clinch. Like, okay, whoa, 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 you can't go down here. I'll never be able to get another fight. <laughs> I heard him. Let me not throw any punches after. Uh, there was a warning there to Brazil. Stop hitting him in the back of the head. Okay. The, the... I have to make this look real. Let me hit him where I can't knock him out. <laughs> one on the back of the head, one on the hip. How would you compare it? Oh. Winfrey, how would you compare that to the one that dropped uh, Randy Couture from Lesnar? I mean... Because that looks scraping. That didn't look like a solid shot. That looked like it brushed him against the nose and he took a bump. Again... I said this didn't look like a legitimate fight. It looked fixed. That's kind of the reason why. Like, Wilder's got serious power. That's There's no denying that. Mm -hmm. But a brush against the nose shouldn't have knocked him on his ass like that. No, it shouldn't. Welcome to the other side of the looking glass, my friend. (laughs) He's just so fucking bad. (laughs) Like, he's worse than John Ruiz. Here's the replay. See, like that was that looked like a hard, solid shot, and Brazil still standing. Yeah, that's not even the one that put him down. Yeah, that yeah, one. Okay, just... all right. Upon second look, that got him in the teeth too. Yeah, yeah the the second angle actually does kind of help that look better, but still. Again, like I, I'm pretty sure if he wanted to beat that count and continue fighting, he could have. I feel like... So he got maybe, like, two fingers on the glove in the teeth in the bottom of the nose. So it wasn't a solid shot. Not solid, but, again, there's enough... uh, Wilder has enough raw power that you don't need the clean... The absolute cleanest of punches. Okay, well... Which is how he got by for, you know, so long in his career. uh, Well, that and slapping guys in the side of the head. Um... So, again, compare that to the one that drops Randy Couture from Brock Lesnar, which also looked like he just barely touched him. That also glanced... I mean, look, Couture's chin was shot years before he fought Lesnar. Mm-hmm. And Lesnar punched him in the temple. I mean, again, the punch from Lesnar was less a knockout blow and, mo- and more just took his balance. And then Brock got on top of him, and getting Brock Lesnar off of you is a task that... Not impossible, mind you, but it's not easy. And Randy was wobbled, and then Lesnar just kept hitting him repeatedly in the head. All right. Uh, for drunken hilarity purposes, Pat, I'll give you the last word on this. Who thinks this guy is good? <laughs> He's the fucking shits. He, he, he literally has not beaten anybody. They're going to hail this guy like he's fucking good at something when he's I mean, look, not. Th- this guy needed to bribe, what, three judges just to get to a draw with Tyson Fury? Yeah. A, a fucking miracle draw with Tyson Fury, who was out for three years on coke binges. <laughs> Shit, I'm pretty sure I could take some Percocets, and I'll whip this fucking guy's ass in a street fight. Can we get you in the ring with him? You, you look like you could you could fight at heavyweight when I met, when I met you in New York. What's the weight? What's the weight? What's the boxing heavyweight limit? Anything above two hundred pounds. There is no limit. There is no cap. There you oh go. hell! I'll fight him. There we go. I still weigh over two hundred pounds. I think both of you guys could take this guy. And... You know what I do? I not let him get set and throw a right hand. <laughs> <laughs> You, actually, what I thought you were going to say is, you know what I'd do? I wouldn't take the bribe. No, I would take the bribe money, and I'd double-cross all his people, because he's not well-connected. He's from Alabama. the <laughs> fuck do I have to worry about? The Dixie mob? You guys all got wiped out by one guy on Justified. <laughs> now, granted, it took six seasons, but he still fucking did it. Uh, Showtime. Which, did Showtime do the Canelo pay-per-view that we just watched? No, that was that ridiculous, no. awful service called the Zone. Oh, that's that doesn't right. actually freak that. That doesn't even mic the ring. Like I went back and watched a different version of that fight with proper production values, and frankly, it changed a little bit of my perspective on how the fight went because I could actually hear some of the impact that was being landed. And uh, whereas the Zone's coverage, like, oh, they're landing punches, but I can't hear them because. <laughs> 
No, like, DAZN doesn't actually have production teams because Bellator streams on them and Bellator's production is just, like, handled by Bellator and it sounds like every other Bellator event. Which is still roughly the sound of, you know, vomit hitting the toilet bowl, but... Speaking of which, did Jack Swagger win his fight? Yes, and then had the single worst post-fight promo I've ever heard. He got a boner for making somebody tap. Yeah. His actual line about that was, I am rock hard with emotion. I have a boner. <laughs> Terrific. And this is a sport. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, oh. it was a, <laughs> it's an abbreviated night. We, wait, you know, I, okay. wait, wait, wait a minute. Oh, no. Wait a minute. Yes, sir. I cleared a perfectly good Saturday night to do some commentary over something. And what we get to do commentary over... It is a two-minute farce. All right. Well, I, we're we're here. We're, let's 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 take advantage of the opportunity. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I have nothing else to do except go to bed, put my CPAP on, and hit the sack. So, Pat, what do you want to do? I mean, I still got some banquets. There's uh, that thing you 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 put videos on where it shows the video to everybody watching it, and we can commentate over that. I think we should do something with that. Okay. And Wilder's celebration of this win is just comical. Pat, pick a heavyweight fight that people should watch instead of Deontay Wilder. And let's see if we can find it on YouTube. Current or, or any time? Um, you know what? Pick a Tyson fight. Uh, it's a short list. Yeah, there's not a lot of very good Tyson fights to commentate over. I'm not going to lie. All right. I mean, most of them don't last that much longer than this fight did. <laughs> All right. Do, so, do you want Roadhouse or do you want like? I want I want you to be a teacher and str- and say, look, Deontay Wilder is the shit. This is what you should be watching, and that is what. Oh, we want technical uh, heavyweight fighting. Um. Okay. So, I mean, how far back do we want to go? Yeah, that's. Uh, it has to be on YouTube. Right. So well, that's we just... not the question. The question is how far back in like the history of boxing do you want to go? Because there's some genuinely great Jersey Joe Walcott fights out there. Yeah, there's a lot of great technicians who you could watch and be stunned by. Or we could do Roadhouse because it's heavyweights, and that's a little more common. And there, we could do Roadhouse at a little bit of a higher level. How about Roadhouse at a higher level? Okay. Okay. I like that. How about uh, have either of you guys ever seen uh, George Foreman fight Ron Lyle? No. I would guarantee you that is on YouTube. Let's have a look. I'm creating the room, by the way. P- perfect. And yeah, I type it in. The full fight comes up. Okay. Multiple versions of it. Throw the link in the chat. Okay. I uh, have to mute myself for one second there, so forgive me, gentlemen. Oh, this is young George. Nice. So he became pushing George. Got Wilder is still talking. Who thought this was a good idea? <laughs> I'm posting the invite in the chat. Guys, he's been 30 minutes talking about how much he wants to fight Anthony Joshua in the next four years, not fighting Anthony Joshua. Yeah, you know who wants to fight Anthony Joshua? Nobody, but yeah, no, so Nobody wants that. <laughs> nobody actually wants that fight. It's, it's a terrible match for most of the, you know, most of the division. Because he's a bad motherfucker. And we'll be commentating on that fight on June 1st, the day before my birthday. We'll do that. I will, I will absolutely commentate on that one. For those of you who don't know, there's some legendary heavyweight fights that have taken place. And this happens to be one of the, if not the most uh, famous heavyweight slugfest of all time. You have George Foreman coming off his loss to Muhammad Ali in Zaire, Africa for the World Heavyweight Championship, who had been inactive other than a exhibition in Toronto where he had fights with five men in one night. And here you have Ron Lyle, who is coming off of an unsuccessful challenge of the heavyweight championship, but is still one of the top contenders in the world. Uh, And a stylist very much like George, 
He is about power punching. He is about hurting bombs. He is about looking to fight somebody. And, of course, Wilder will not be fighting Anthony Joshua next. He will be fighting a uh, rematch with Lewis King Kong Ortiz, it looks like. So Joshua continues to be better than everybody, and Wilder is a pussy. Okay, well said. All right, so uh, this is January 24th, 1976, uh, about six months before I was, uh, five, a little over five months before I was born. Um, this is on ABC. So we've got, it's a 25 minute video here and this is what we're going to, what can we look forward to here, Mr. Mullen? Roadhouse. All right. No, this is, uh, this is like, this is one of the must see fights before you die. <laughs> okay. Winfrey, you know anything about this one? Not a thing. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, if we're all in the are we all in the room? I'm there. All right. When for you? I here. am not. Where is the link? It's in the uh, the group chat. Oh, there it is. Sorry, my mistake. I will click on that. All right. There you are. All right. Put your kittens on your mittens, and away we go. Unless I'm aware I got that backwards. And we saw we just saw two of the most notorious hairstyles of all time. <laughs> Howard Cosell's toupee and one uh, Don King standing behind him. So Oof. you said this, if I, if I heard you correctly, you said this is after the uh, rematch between Ali and uh, George Foreman. Is that correct? Well, the, the one and only match between Ali and Foreman, yes. Okay. Ali didn't want any more of that. This is George's uh, first fight, official fight after that, other than the exhibition he held in Toronto. Okay. I think I'm confusing uh, the Robo Dope thing and Ali and, uh, sorry, Frazier and George Foreman. Yes, they would have a second fight uh, a few months after this at the uh, Long and uh, the Nassau Coliseum. Oh, wow. It's hard, it's hard to imagine the Nassau Coliseum having anything but wrestling or ice capades of the circus. It was not a popular boxing venue. There was only two fights I remember there. That one and the second fight between uh, Roberto Duran and my old trainer, Edwin Virouette. I mean, the Nassau Coliseum wasn't a great venue, period. No, uh, it's no. still not. <laughs> I don't know what they've done to it. Uh, they haven't demolished it and put something better there. No. Nah. Um, I mean, it was a place to go see shows, but it was nothing special. So, one of the funny things is that these two guys at this point in time were considered super heavyweights. Uh, the average heavyweight weighed about 210, 215 during this era. Oof. Lyle weighs in about 220. Foreman probably somewhere in the neighborhood right there of 230, 235, which, of course, knowing his later career is very svelte for him. Yeah. Is it me or does Caesar's Palace look like a pile of shit? Caesar's Palace is technically the outdoor Caesar's Palace, not what it would come to be known as. And yeah. yes, it did originate as a pile of shit. Because up until the mid-90s, it was basically a, a, an arena built in a parking lot. Yeah, th this is not... Again, this period in time, uh, they didn't have a great... They didn't like really actually have a venue. Uh, it, it would take like three more casinos being demolished and then other things rebuilt in the, in various places over the next like 10 years before it became a decent venue. Cuz the only thing I can compare this to that looks this awkward and this shitty for this level and uh of a sports entertainment uh match is WrestleMania 4. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking honestly the StubHub Center. I'm not a, not familiar with it with the building. It uh, there, it's a it's a small venue in Carson, California, that held a lot of boxing matches. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably about ten years ago, mostly for HBO. Oh God, didn't we? We did one recently where they held it at like Paramount Theater or something, or whatever, whatever theater in Los Angeles, and that one looked like crap too. Yeah, Club Nokia or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. And we get a good little stare down. And we are ready and raring to go. Once again, this is George Foreman versus Ron Lyle, 1976 heavyweight match at Caesar's Palace. George, of course, is the former heavyweight champion of the world. His only loss at this point 
to Muhammad Ali. Lyle has been in with pretty much most of the top contenders at the time. Guys like Jerry Quire. Wow. Oh, Jesus Wild Christ. Christ. There's your Deontay Wilder precursor. <laughs> Even that was a better punch. <laughs> I was going to say, shades of Roman Reigns. <laughs> he was going for a Superman punch. To the body. <laughs> yes. <laughs> also, well, screw Roman Reigns. Fair enough. Um, he apparently, his uh, his cancer baby face pop has finally worn off. Lasted about three weeks longer than I thought it would. Indeed. All right, so we actually see some boxing here, some jabbing and feeling each other out. We're uh, not quite into the roadhouse portion of this fight just yet. No, and Lyle trying to double and triple the jab against Big George, who has arguably one of the three best heavyweight jabs of all time, especially at this point in his career. And Lyle pops one off on him. Yeah, this is... Foreman's such an interesting case study to go back and rewatch because he's also a great example of just the efficacy of shoving. Like, not even punching, just pushing your opponent. Let me see the uh, first I, clinch of the fight. I mean, Ali complained about that after their fight that George pushed him a lot. And, I mean, pushing's a great technique. It's, it's illegal in boxing, and George wouldn't get away with it if he were boxing today. But a lot of his success comes from just, okay, you want to come in? No, I'm going to push you over here and then club you in the face. Well, he wouldn't get away with it if, they, if no one was trying to back him for their network or their app. It's true. Fair and oh. there's a good little swipe that knocked Lyle off balance. That long left hand of George. How long was George's reach? Because good grief, that man has arms. I think I Lyle... want to say George. I want to say George had an 82 inch reach. I think Lyle That's... just tried to punch him in the dick. Like he Probably. was really low. <laughs> either that, or he's at, or the, either that, or he's deliberately going for the hips to try and slow down George's feet. You got big men with big bodies and a blind side for the referee. Why not? And again, you see what George wants to do. He wants to take the center, digs a right hand to the body. That was a good right. He what wants to keep the center. I feel like George is dropping his hands a lot. Like he's keeping him down by by. He was keeping him down by his waist. Well, if you look at George, he does keep him down by his waist, but most of the time his hands are extended, and mm. it's almost a cheat because you're not supposed to leave extended hands out there to help you close distance or judge distance faster. And Lyle got right, a good right hand behind the ear. George Ooh. is hurt. Oh, my goodness. Lyle with a big right. Yeah, now Foreman working the uppercuts in close. He's trying to tie him up now. Try, uh, he took a couple of good shots there. Yeah. Lyle, Lyle was swinging for the fences. Ooh, right George to the kidney. George is still hurt. He took that left hook clean to the chin. Yeah, he... I don't want to say completely saved by the bell, but he was happy to get out of that round. Yeah, Lyle was trying to take his lungs from him and everything else in his body cavity, for that matter. You see Gil Clancy, the new head trainer of George Foreman after the Ali fight, trying to get the smelling sauce into George and wake him up. Ooh, short right that hand. That was a right great over. short right hand. Do they still allow that, the smelling salts between rounds? They do not. I mean, they do. They use. They allow it for. Uh, I know, like strongman competitions, but and weightlifters always like snort up a bit of that stuff before they go lift a significant, an unholy amount of weight. But so, yeah, you're allowed to pop ammonia caps now. I was definitely afraid this was going to be a one camera shoot. And um, thankfully, this is this is this is at least looking like three shit, like three cameras. Are they well, doing the cover? Are they doing the cover George Foreman with towels in between rounds thing? They are, because it is a little bit chillier in Las Vegas than they anticipated in January. Yeah, Vegas Vegas gets real hot in certain times of years, but, it, I mean, deserts are about precipitation, not temperature. Yeah, it, Man, was, George, freezing. it was freezing when we George, drove through New Mexico. Go ahead, Pat. We're just working his left hand a lot more this round to try to keep Lyle away, but he's already taken two good short right hands again. Yeah, his that defensive posture he adapted through a lot of the first round is just not playing out against that overhand. He needs to get more, get that lead hand a little bit higher. That's straight In addition, right. Just keeping it, it busy. That, that straight light, did it land? Did it graze? I wasn't quite sure if it had if it uh, made impact or not. It touched him, but at the end of it, so it wasn't full impact. Yeah, 
And George is a lot more active with his lead hand this round. He's mm. starting to get a little bit comfortable, too. He's throwing a lot more hooks. But there's Lyle again with that right hand, finding the gap. He got him in the nose with a jab. Oof. Oh, that was that, Lyle. That, he got a little bit... He, he got a little bit wobbled by that right. Lyle put one on the his... Oh, Lyle my gets, God. Yeah, Foreman trying to take his face off. Now we Foreman. Go to the body, George. If all you do is headhunt, you're going to punch yourself out a little bit. And there's that classic awkward Foreman right hand to the body. <laughs> and you can see, he's almost afraid to pull the trigger here along the ropes after his fight with Ali. After all, he uh, just tired him out so consistently with that. Oh, oh. it's Set up finding cut. some open looks. So, Pat, tell me, if Lyle's not on the not in the corner like that, does he go down after that flurry? Probably. <laughs> There's a very good chance, considering who's hitting him and how much he's hitting him. George is one of the hardest punchers in boxing history. <laughs> Jesus, look at those two. <laughs> that, look, th listen. This you, is the Ron last. Lyle, of I'm not going to underscore Ron Lyle's toughness. Ron Lyle got knifed in the joint 19 times and survived. Oof. Look, th this is like the last era of boxing when men were men. You know, they like would chew gravel and guzzle gasoline. And I bl frankly, I blame Oscar De La Hoya for that era of fighter going away after he paid off the judges to screw him and to screw Marvin Hagler. You mean Ray Leonard? Ray Leonard, my mistake. You're, yeah, Ray Leonard, not yeah, not De La Hoya. I don't like De La Hoya either, but different reasons. God damn yeah, it, went free. Go ahead. So, tell me so I'm we, wrong. All right, look, I got the name wrong, but am I wrong in principle? No. <laughs> so what we're seeing here is a shift in momentum. Now George has kind of found the range, but I think it's interesting that post Ali, he's not opening up along the ropes on Lyle the way he would have normally. Two things: one, Lyle is not as defensively adept as Ali. And two, the ropes here are not the loose ropes that Ali asked for in Zaire, where he could lean all the way against them and take the sting off George's punches. Well, uh, Lyle also is very clearly not nearly as adept at fighting in the clinch as Ali was. I mean, that was the entire key to Ali's career renaissance was after he lost some of the speed, he really did master how to use the clinch properly in boxing. No, and you can see George is... You're really the, making some awkward movements. There's so the pushing from George. So I don't know if this is an edit or if this is how ABC did it back in the day, but there have been no commercial breaks during this. Well, it depends on when it aired on the block, but you know, a lot of times ABC would go straight through on a certain fight. Like, they're live right now, so they only have time for one-minute commercial spots. Yeah, but if this were today, they'd be doing one-minute commercial spots. And this At isn't point, today. It's also broadcast TV, so... You know, they had an undercard that they could get most of that stuff in on. Oh, Foreman <laughs> just short on the right hand, but Lyle gets a good counter in. And George, like Robert said, push off. Nice body shots from George. Lyle really sagged into the ropes there. <laughs> and Lyle's almost trying to bait George in for that overhand right. He's leaning, leaning, looking for the opening. Yeah, he's kind of sticking his chin out there. And he might also be playing a little bit of head games. Like, he's recognized that George is a lot more hesitant about the ropes and is daring him to really open up in this position that he's clearly not all that comfortable with. And you can see Lyle sticking an extended left hand out there. Figures if George can get away with it, so can I. That's one of the things if you're... Well, there's a good right hand by Oof. Lyle. That was a good right. Mm. Nice jab. And Foreman yeah. immediately goes back to just jabbing like, all right. Well, notice he's also been hit with quite a few of Lyle's jabs. I mean, he really flicks those off and, you know, and uh, tags him right in the nose. Yeah, the, the issue is that Foreman's jab is more consistent. Like, they'll, they'll spear on jabs occasionally, but Lyle's jabs are about, what, one out of every eight to ten punches he throws, whereas with George, it's one out of every, like, three or four. Mm. And, and George's jab is a power punch, make no mistake. Yeah, he, he's putting weight behind that thing. He's not just flicking. And now he's putting a combination together. He's just short on the left hook, but he's got Lyle in the corner. He hasn't taken full advantage of it. That was a weird-looking overhand there. From well, Lyle's... Some of Lyle's a good short right. And some of Lyle's defense is a lot of extended arms, kind of the old mummy guard, 
which is shockingly effective in boxing. Uh, I mean, if you want another more modern example in a different sport, Daniel Cormier uses a lot of the mummy guard because it shuts down punches. It leaves you very vulnerable to kicks to the head. But so I don't know if you noticed, but they cut the corner out of that one. I'm guessing this is I'm, I'm guessing this is an edit, and they cut the commercial out. Yeah, and and this far through two rounds, I have Ron Lyle ahead two to one. I have it Canelo uh, five to four. <laughs> that makes sense. But look, <laughs> Canelo not Canelo not even in the womb. And Ron Lyle got another good right hand through over the that top. That was a good what? That was a good right. George is a little bit wobbly there. No percussion. He got a Lyle little dicks to the body. He got a little shaky knee on that one. Ooh! Oh! oh he's he's down. Oh! Down and goes down Foreman. goes Foreman. Well, he's back up again. A tremendous combination from Lyle, and the big man is down. For, Foreman looks absolutely just, just, just annoying. I mean, look, look. Foreman has this going for him. He doesn't look all that much different when he's completely coherent versus when he's punch drunk. No, he just had. The, I wasn't even saying like like he was on Queer Street or anything like that. Now, it was more of he just looks like. Well, now I feel sheepish. <laughs> Can't believe I got dropped. <laughs> God damn it! I'm on, I'm on ABC TV. How can this happen? <laughs> And now they're starting to go. Oh, to now war we get Oh, right Jesus Christ! Trading All those left, left hooks. <laughs> oh, they're just clubbing each other. Oh my and God! Lyle. They pull and a rock and down. yeah, down goes Lyle. How do you like them apples, bitch? Yeah, they were actually. There was a couple there where they knocked each other. They they hit each other like simultaneously. They they pulled a Rocky Apollo moment. Oh yeah, no, this is these two are going at it, and now Foreman comes in for the kill. So what happened here, uh, Pat? What happened to boxing where you don't see much of this sort of thing anymore? Crack cocaine in the 1980s. <laughs> I was gonna, I, I was just going to say Mike Tyson, but okay. <laughs> Crack cocaine in the 1980s. Lyle and Foreman are two guys from impoverished backgrounds who sought a better way, and they found it through boxing. In the 1980s, you did that with crack cocaine, and that's why you saw so much less outreach for talented heavyweights in America in the 1980s, and you see Foreman just oh, going left here. Oh, yeah. Good grief. So, ha- so okay, so clearly... And he oh, and then off. Lyle cracked so that. Clearly Lyle, that clearly Lyle was hanging on to the ropes, like literally like laundry, just kind of shifting all of his weight there until he caught a breath. I don't they had the same rule about knockdowns against and the ropes that they do now. <laughs> oh, God. And now Foreman is hanging on to Lyle to stay up. Oh, that right. Oh, tap Foreman goes down. Foreman. Okay, if this were today, he'd be done. If no. you, fall fa- you fall face first like that, you're out. Eh, Tyson Fury is evidence to the contrary. And the bell probably saves Foreman there. Good grief, that was around. Well, you can't be saved by the bell in today's boxing, yeah? Depending. Well, depending he, wasn't on... sa- he wasn't necessarily saved by the bell. He was up and they counted completed, but that was right at the end of the round. But no, I'm, it's just a general thing. You're, I mean, they always, they say Upper it now. Left at, hook. At the end of right it. Right hand. Foreman with the right left. Foreman with Lyle the left. Lyle magic the boom. Right. Lowers uh. the boom. <laughs> yeah, there was no fake in that one. Dude, he fell on his head. Yeah, the other thing about great heavyweight boxers is you know, the salaries in the NFL really started taking off again towards the 80s. So, I mean, Pat referenced it before that famous line about who's the next great heavyweight boxer. He's playing, he's playing linebacker for the, you know, the Ravens. Yeah, all right, that makes yeah, he's sense. He's playing linebacker for the Ravens, or he's playing power forward for the Knicks. Yeah, there's it, a lot of the other sports really started hitting it, really started gaining a lot of momentum. And the athletic and a lot of the athletic talent started being scooped up for those ventures rather than getting punched in the face. And schools were much more inclined to coach and allow those programs than they were to allow kids to box. Yeah, Here we you, are round five. You yeah. don't have the you don't have the school boxing programs anymore like you used to. I was say, given the amount of special needs kids my wife deals with, we need to bring back boxing. We need to bring it back just to stop raising pussies. Yeah, you and I just said the same thing, but differently. Look, um, Marvin. Ha- look, Marvin Hagler used to do all of his road work in army boots because he thought running shoes were for pussies. That's a man right there. That is a man. Oh 
God, Foreman's jab. Just, I can't believe he recovered that quickly from that knockdown because that was a gnarly one. Ooh, oh, the man. left. Oh, left. Okay. Saying, like, it looked like he yeah. went out. He, he fucking landed on his head, but he just he got right back up again. Oh, you talking yeah. about that uppercut? Oh, <laughs> Lyle's gonna punch himself out trying to knock George Foreman <laughs> unconscious. Lyle, and hitting. Lyle has been saved so much in this fight by by those ropes. Again, taking notes from Muhammad Ali using those ropes. And oh, oh that, that left. Like, oh, and Foreman's left. Every time now Foreman Lyle's has stopped. gone, every time Foreman has gone down, he's been in like almost the center of the ring. Every time Lyle looks like he's going to go down, he hangs. He he's, <laughs> there. It is. He you know he goes straight to the ropes. We got a series of jabs, from George, and then Ryle, and Lyle still blasts him with the right. Lyle has given up fucking defense, is what's happened here. All oh, those body shots from both guys. Oh, oh, the uppercut. I mean, like, I there is a, a ten, technical aspect to this fight, but this is this is starting to mimic fucking tough man. Like they, like there's no they, pretense they of defense. They both know there's technique, and they both kind of. Re- I mean, they've thrown so much at each other. Oh, now, this Jesus, is technically mother- a knockdown. Yeah, yeah to, I was going to say, in the world, that's a knockdown. I, that wasn't the rule at the time. No, it was. If you are held up by the ropes, oh, that's really? a knockdown. Yeah. So the ref just screwed that up. Okay, fair enough. I, I, forget, wonder, I always forget when that rule was implemented. I'm wondering if ABC told them, let them unless somebody actually falls on the canvas, just let it go. Foreman pushing oh. everything he's got. <laughs> and Lyle goes down. Down. Uh, There we go. Uh, see, smart. that was smart of Foreman not to go crazy there and keep just pounding on him, like back up and let him fall. Yeah, that's it. He's done. Like dinner. Put a fork in him. Yep, we're out. <laughs> wow. That was a good one, Pat. That was a really it, nice choice. It is a top five on the list of heavyweight fights you must see. And now I have seen it. Outstanding. Yeah, that was that would be uh, George's could... uh, second to last win before his first retirement. You can just see on some of those punches the names for George's future children stop being something loosely creative and just being George, George, <laughs> George. <laughs> All right. I mean, we... go ahead. Where, where we go from here, George would go on to, as I said, fight Joe Frazier at the Meadowlands and knock him out in uh, five rounds. And That's just then... a bad matchup for Frazier, man. It's, it's just, just, just stylistically. And uh, then he would go on to lose an upset decision in Puerto Rico, controversially, to Jimmy Young. Oh, he's and lucky that is he where... Get, he's lucky he just didn't get stabbed. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true, too. Although he's not going after the promotion there, so... Uh, but no, he, uh, he would lose a controversial upset decision to Jimmy Young and have a vision of God and become a preacher. And then years later, he went from this menacing villain of a heavyweight to everybody's grandpa who they wanted to see fight and win and not get hurt. And Lyle, Lyle would get a shot at Muhammad Ali later in the year and lose very much in the same way Foreman did by rope dope in the 11th round knockout and not really contend seriously after that. He would have a fight with Jerry Cooney later on in Cooney's ascent to a title shot, but never really mounted a serious uh, title run again. This is one of those fights that just like takes a significant portion of who you are as a person and you leave it in the canvas as you exit that ca- as you exit the ring. So the moral of this story is don't don't look at Deontay Wilder as a competent uh, heavyweight championship boxer. Look to your elders. Look to George Foreman. Yeah, just look to Joshua, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> not that we, we, we don't have to go back in time, man. Look, look at Anthony Joshua versus Klitschko. That's a great fight. Okay. Uh, Pat. Do you want to do another one of these, or are you satisfied and we can do uh, plugs? I can do as many of these as you guys want to do if you're up for it. I got I got tons of these. You know what? See if it, let, let me see if Anthony Joshua versus Klitsch goes on here. Since I've never seen it. Really? You seriously have not seen Joshua that, and Klitschko? That is, a, that is a wonderful fight. That was the best heavyweight fight I'd seen probably since maybe like uh, Razor Ruddock, Tommy Morrison. It's several, several years. Huh. I actually don't know how I missed this one. Oh, it was on Sky Sports, that's why. Because you didn't 
Uh, you know what? Because you are a fine, upstanding person of moral integrity who would not steal it. Nope. No, Joshua doesn't really fight on, like, U.S. pay-per-view. He's a massive star in the U.K., and very, and almost no one in the States knows who he is. It's a crying shame. All right, so here we go. This is April... Can we just retire Michael Buffer already? Jeez. This no, is... come on. He's the buff. This is well, look, I respect him. I respect the history. I respect the fact that he got into popular culture. He's a real. He's really good at his job. I mean, I'm not knocking that. My question is more: How have we not found someone better by this point? This is April 29th, 2017. So this is fairly recent. Uh, Anthony Joshua versus Vladimir Klitschko. Uh, this fight. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this was for the belt that Tyson Fury basically vacated after he had his breakdown. I, I don't think so. I think uh, that there were, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is for uh, two belts that Fury was uh, stripped of for refusing to fight Joshua, and both of those sanctioning bodies had both Klitschko and Joshua as the top two rated contenders. Fair enough. I, I could be wrong, but I believe that's the scenario. So is this London, or is this, uh, is this somewhere in England, or is this Germany? Uh, I want to say this is at Wembley, but I, again, could be wrong. I will look that up. So I'm wondering if... Uh, so this is on Sky Sports in uh, Europe. I'm wondering... Um, yeah, they were at Wembley. If Europe... Ha- uh, sorry, if uh, if where this could be seen in the U.S., like if it was on Epics or something. Uh, Tape delayed replay on HBO. Yeah, okay. this was HBO broadcast. Okay. Because I remember seeing it on HBO and avoiding uh, most of the news all day. Oh, I know yeah, why. This... I know why I missed this. I was dying at the time. That's right. You say that but you're still alive. Yeah, I came back, and, and you will again. So I got better. <laughs> I was I was only mostly dead in April. Oh, Mark, God. Mark, you just saw George Foreman mostly dead, and look what he did. Uh, curse was, you! I have no doubt. Curse you, Vladimir Klitschko, for this walkout music. I I have it on mute. What's he walking? I, I'm assuming it's still Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? It is. Yeah, can't stop. Terrific. I, I mean, he used it for the better part of 15 years. I yeah. mean, again, like I, the man gets credit for just sticking to it, but I don't care for the Chili Peppers generally. I think their music's unbelievably dated. I like the Chili Peppers. I just think Faith No More does what they do better. Fair enough. I would agree I also, with that. I also have like three other fighters that come out to Chili Peppers songs where I just can't stand. First of well, all, I, I'm against any Russian coming out to anything but the Russian National Anthem. Uh, there's other things besides the Russian National Anthem you can come out no, to. No, there isn't. No, no. There I'm are. That. Well, no, okay, first of all, you don't mean the Russian National Anthem. You guys mean the old Soviet National yes. Anthem. Yes, correct. Because I think he's actually like Ukrainian, isn't he? Yes, uh, he is. Yeah. So, uh, and look, the Soviet Union was a terrible, terrible place for Russians. It was actually worse for the satellite countries. Sure. Yeah, but they had a bitching, imposing national anthem. Oh, that. yeah, no, look, it's a great piece of music. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, this, this is like, about jingoism, Winfrey, not, you know, accuracy or anything else. Like, so honestly, then, as great as Apollo's entrance at Rocky IV is to fight Drago, Drago's entrance in Moscow against Rocky might be just as good. It's better. I'm not a fan of James Brown. Oh, my God. Jesse and I had so much fun. Carl, Carl Weathers is just amazing. Jesse True. and I had so much fun with the uh, Living in America video. That's one of my favorite Metal Hammer of Doom extras we've ever done. Detroit today! Detroit today! Dallas! Dallas! <laughs> Drive the car! Pick up the mail! <laughs> That was sort you know, of I, I, I say this I say this completely unironically. Rocky Four has one of the best soundtracks in movie history. Dude, oh, it's, <laughs> it's, it, I think it's the first album my son fell in love with. Though ashamedly he also likes Imagine Dragons, so eh. Oh, I thought Yeah, you have not beaten that child enough. I am aware. Ashamedly, his favorite song on the album is Double or Nothing by Kenny Loggins and Roberta Flack. Ooh. No, he hates fucking Double or Nothing. Like he likes okay, everything you, else you've on done there. You've something right. He loves every song on the Rocky Four soundtrack except for Double Another. He's like, yeah, that's that's one we can skip. Dude, there it's... was a there was a training video on YouTube a while back of George Chavallo. and if you don't know who George Chavallo is, he's 
the like one of the greatest Canadian heavyweights of all time. He fought Ali, he fought Frazier, fought Foreman, and he's noted for having the greatest chin in the history of boxing because he was never knocked down. And there's like old school training footage, or at least there was, it's not up anymore, of him training for his first fight with Ali, just all in black and white and real like dungeon style training to war by Vince DiCola. Nice. And like, I, I don't know how it came out. I was at my, we, we had just gotten back from like uh, the Jersey Shore and we're at my buddy Pete's house and like uh, we're just screwing around watching stuff on YouTube and that came up. We just chugged raw eggs and ran laps around his block. <laughs> yeah. Damn right. And then once we yacked, the push-up contest was on. Okay, we can all agree also, just for the record, No Easy Way Out is the best song on the Rocky IV soundtrack, right? By or a country ever. mile. Okay, good. Oh, you know what? Uh, uh. No, Don't get me wrong. I no. love Hearts on... I love Hearts on Fire. I really do, but... Yeah. It's no, second go, to No I'm Easy Way go, Out. I'm going to go with No Easy Way Out, and I'll tell you why. Because there was this music file sharing service called Napster. <laughs> and literally the first song I downloaded on Napster was Robert Tepper, No Easy Way Out. So that went. Have you heard our Metal Hammer of Doom for the No Easy Way Out video in the creep factor in that in, in, that we talked in about? The Abandoned Warehouse? Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> where, he's, where Robert Tepper is chasing the viewer around the warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Joshua. Now, now this is walkout music. I have it on mute, so I cannot He's coming tell out to Carmina Barana. That's perfectly acceptable. Like the number of people who just come out to crappy music when there's all this great classical stuff. Oh, look at like Kennedy Golovkin, who was the man for so long, but he came out to Seven Nation Army. A th- really? I, appre- I appreciated him switching to the th- just the theme from the Matrix because he's freaking Lomachenko. Oh, I was gonna say you're talking Lomachenko. I'm oh, talking my Golovkin. Yeah. Golovkin, yeah. Oh god, Golovkin coming out to Seven Nation Army was so bad. I told Jesse when I make my son become a professional fighter, he's coming out to a song by Battle Beast that we reviewed on their most recent Metal Hammer of Doom. If there's a band that probably made music designed to be walked out to, it's probably Man of War. Yeah. Mm, agreed. They've never yeah. been on Metal Hammer of Doom. I don't even know when the last Man of War album was. I'm thinking 1988. Well, you might be right about that. Is not is, Did John Bush ever go back to them? No. Oh, wait, was that also, only for, wait, was that only for his hype package? Is he going to walk out to something else? Come on, man, don't do that. But I also used to use Typo Negative on occasion as my walkout songs. That's an interesting choice. Well, kill all I, the white I got people. To, I, I, I got to be pretty friendly with Pete Steele before he passed, so... Yeah, well, I love Typo Negative, so you won't get any argument from me. Yeah, but he, I, I got to be pretty friendly with Pete Steele before he passed, uh, and so like he actually was at two of my fights, which was really cool. That's cool. Is everybody else's picture as shitty as mine right now? Uh, no. I, th- I think my picture's pretty good. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm pretty happy with mine. It might just be my computer then. Okay, no, he's, ca- he's actually walking out to something else. That was just for his pre-hype thing. I, I could, don't recognize this piece. It could be the bank we're talking, but... <laughs> Guys, it takes, a, con- it takes uh... a confident man to wear white trunks... White shoes, white gloves, in a white robe on your walk to the ring. Does Anthony Joshua have a better body than I do? Anthony Joshua has a better body than like eighty-seven and a half percent of the entire world. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm part of that eighty-seven percent. I mean, it might have been the jacket you were wearing, but you look like a you you look like a lineman in football, Pat. When I met you, yeah, I'm very broad-shouldered. I do think the the baby blue Henning jacket brought that out a little bit, but like I said, I wasn't. I, I, I it was hard to tell. And then the next time I saw you, we were sitting. So, uh, you know, and I'm and I don't know if you are going to accept this or not, but I wasn't really checking out your body the whole time we hung out together. I mean, um, we both know that's a lie, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> yeah, Mark, come on, man. Why? Why are you from? Okay, well, when I wasn't looking for John, who kept ditching us, I was checking out your body. You're right. Yeah, John was looking for a place to nap. <laughs> so I see I see the white gloves and everything and all I can think of is the great white hype Terry look what I've got you I was going to say white Sage Northcutt 
No, I mean the God, that movie. poor guy. Ugh. There was a yeah, rumor that he was going to play Drago's son in Creed 2. He'd have been better off than continuing his, his MMA career. Well, I mean, he it, signed with one, and one's first thing is, okay, here's this world champion kickboxer who's a legitimate purple belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah, we're going to give you a probably... And all right, and, I, I mean, Cosmo's, Cosmo's record is like 18-1 and one or 18-2 and two in MMA. Like, the man yeah. can fight. And he's, he's a legitimate, great stand-up fighter in MMA terms. Yeah, so, I mean, he broke his face in like eight places with that punch. With that one right hand. Did Sage now get cut from the UFC, or did he quit? A while ago. Well? well, he chose not to re-sign with them. One offered him a lot of money. Okay. Well, the UFC also didn't offer him the same deal he was getting when they originally signed him, and he wasn't going to take less money to continue to be in the UFC and fight legitimate competition... So instead, he took more money from one to fight a theoretically lower level of competition, and instead they and they like they put him in there against legitimately one of the better fighters they have, and one actually has a lot of good fighters you've just never heard of. Yeah, it's the lower weight guys that the UFC sucks at promoting. Yeah. Oh God, the guy that knocked out Eddie Alvarez. Yeah. Uh, well, also in, like one's weight fair- cutting policy is so stupid. In defense of the UFC, I don't think there's a market for the the lower weight guys here than there might be across the seas. I mean, so you're saying it's exactly the same as boxing? Correct. That's a fair (sighs) point. We like like our monster men here. We're not into we're we're not into the midgets. The worst thing about HBO pulling the plug on their boxing is over the past six months of their last boxing broadcast. They put on some great junior flyweight, flyweight, junior bantamweight fights with legitimate world-class competition, and those were great. Oh, they were great. And here we got the tail of the tape. We're, we're finally here, folks. Jesus Christ. Anthony Joshua is a scary-looking motherfucker. He's a large man. You, you know what's funny? Is he still scary standing next to Vlad? Yeah, and Vlad's not exactly a cuddly human being. No. He's very stupid. You know, and again, I know that a lot of people are going to put Vlad over as the superior Klitschko because of his longer career. Vitali was so good. Oh, he God. was so good. Well, Vitali was also the, a much bigger puncher than Vladimir. Yeah, he, he was, was. And, he, and he took it better. That's the big difference. I was so I would say um, 15, 2015, 16, maybe even earlier. I was watching a lot of boxing. And I actually did notice that at the time that his brother, but uh, that Vitaly's fights were m- much more fun to watch for me than than uh, Vladimir's. I, I think look- I, I think Vlad just because of his previous lack of success in certain instances was more inclined to fight uh, a very disciplined uh, safety first fight, whereas Vitaly a lot of times he just knew he was that good. He didn't have to keep his hands up and back away and move. Like, when he fought Chris Ariola, he had his hands at his waist in the center of the ring, daring Ariola to come at him and lighting him up with combinations. Uh, Vladimir also would do these really stupid things. Like, wasn't there one fight that he won literally without throwing a, his right hand at all? Yeah, he tore his rotator cuff. And just like, okay, only the left. Oh, yep. and, I mean, it... Go ahead. I mean, and credit to the guy for being that tough. Torn rotator cuffs really suck. Yeah, Vitali. that's how Vitali got one of his only two losses. He tore his rotator cuff against Chris Bird and decided not to continue. And, of course, he was labeled a quitter and he had no heart and whatever. Yes. And, of course, what he was doing is trying to prolong his career. Yeah, so- I, I think – I do not understand the ridiculous dude bro logic of I get – uh, well, I'd be in there to fight. Like, you're the same morons who say, I'd play in the NFL for free. Yeah, because you're useless. Well, the, average just... NFL, you, the average NFL player makes millions of dollars because they do something a select percentage of humanity can do. Well, there's, you jackasses there's... who go, I'd play for free, sure, no one would watch. There's the distinction of, though, like a guy like Vitaly quitting in a fight he was well ahead in with a torn rotator cuff versus Victor Ortiz quitting when things got difficult for him. Oh, dude, yeah. Victor Ortiz would quit when, you know, if you called him a name in the ring. <laughs> Look, like, I remember that first night where he lost to Madonna. Things started off well for him. He dropped Madonna, and then Madonna came back and was like, I'm still here to fight, knocked him down, 
and Victor Ortiz quit. There's hey, Arnold. Arnie. You see the guy who tried to drop kick Arnold? <laughs> and Arnold barely moved. So, God, that was so hilarious. Didn't Arnold, Victor Ortiz like almost like cry in the ring? His More his post once. fight his post fight words were, "I don't think I deserve to get beat up like this." Right, and I was like, "What?" And I, I just started watching boxing at the time, and I'm like, "Who is this pussy?" I was in Atlantic City that night, okay, and this is a true story. I was in Atlantic City that night, and Victor Ortiz had just left top rank and signed with Golden Boy for that fight. And well, that would explain top- why he felt he didn't deserve to get beat up like that. Well, and Top Rank was running a show in Atlantic City that night with, uh, oh, God, what's his name? Yuriorka Scamboa on the semifinal bout and Juan Manuel Lopez on the final. And the, I happened to be at the bar at Bally's with two guys from Top Rank were talking, and I was there with two friends. We weren't at the fight. We were just gambling, having fun. And they were talking about, oh, yeah, you know, Top Rank makes them. Golden Boy breaks them. I said, you guys were Top Rank. They go, yeah. I said, your guy Lopez sucks. <laughs> and he said, what are you talking about? I said, first of all, Gamboa would eat him alive, which I maintain had they fought, he would have. And second off, I said, your guy, Lop- your guy Lopez can't take it. And they were like, what are you talking about? You don't know what you're talking about. I said, yeah, Lopez ain't that good. And uh, he, his next fight, he fought a veteran, not a, not a world beater or anything, but just a tough veteran named Rogers Matagwe from Africa. Never a world champion, not a... This guy went life and death with Rogers, walked away with a very fortunate decision, and never lived up to the hype train that they were putting him to be. Speaking of so, not knowing what you're talking about, so our Canelo fight, our Canelo podcast, shortly afterwards I went on Twitter and I, I think it was somebody from um, one of the one of the uh, boxing blogs uh, put something very like pro Canelo, very positive on the on the Canelo fight for Canelo, and I and I think I was like. I think I, 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 my reaction to that was, I'm like, oh, the fight was fixed or whatever. And I, the response I got back was, says somebody who clearly doesn't know anything about boxing. Yeah, that's a ridiculous... That's like, all they're trying to do is dismiss because they can't actually defend their position. That's literally what it is. Uh, like, if you bring up the points where I didn't Look, see you wanna, you, cleanly... I mean, if you want to argue that Canelo won that fight, fine, let's sit down, let's go b- round by round, and let's have a discussion... I say he didn't win, and your response is you clearly know nothing. Like, all right, you don't actually want to try and support your case with – you don't want to actually support your point. No, and I'm not going to get into it with these guys, you know. Like, I, I just – I don't – she, she called it my Twitter feed is sort of a, is sort of a pile of trash. But um, I, I just, mean, Twitter's a giant pile of trash. You're not that different. Um, I just I just don't feel the need to engage with a lot of these people. It's like, you know, like – you know, the people who were my friends or whatever, and we, you know, we might have like a minor disagreement or whatever. Like Sam McCarty and I were talking about Game of Thrones, and it was like he said a thing, I said a thing, he said I said, and we're like, okay, we're done with this. <laughs> like, you know, it was nice and peaceful. Yeah, you should really only engage in tw- only engage with Twitter with people you actually know, because otherwise, you just, there's no point to it. Like I did that once. I went w- one time. I okay, I tweeted something and it. I just got to like, it got caught up in other stuff, mm-hmm. and then a bunch of other people had conversations because they were replying to other people who were replying to me. I got tagged and all that crap, and there was one of them that made just a stupid point. So I decided, all right, I'm going to be civil about this, but I'm going to respond. And this guy and I had like a three or four exchange, and we arrived at a conclusion that okay, turns out we're both reasonable people. Wow, we had like what we took away from that was hey. This is our one positive interaction on Twitter for the entire year. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But on the negative side, this is my last banquet. Aw. However, I will point out that obviously in the corner of Vladimir, you saw his brother Vitali. You also saw Jonathan Banks, former cruiserweight fighter and later heavyweight fighter, who took over for the late Emmanuel Stewart. And I will be the first to say I don't think Vladimir without Emmanuel was capable of anywhere near what he was with him. No. Okay. Here, I found it. This was from actually FightNights.com. Um, across the board here at Fight Nights, we pick Canelo by decision. Safe pick. And I wrote, Jacobs really should have won. Hashtag fight, uh, fix was in, um, et cetera, et cetera. And his response was, said nobody who knows boxing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know shit about boxing. Look, so, if you want to again, like if you want to put forth an argument that Canelo won fair play, 
Like, I, give, I give don't agree, a- but, like, actually, Wait. if your argument is, well, all the judges agreed, and I'm going along with the herd, that's not actually an argument. Right. No, if you tell me something where, you know, I felt that the punches landed looked visibly more more hurtful to Jacobs, blah, blah, blah. I felt like the punches that were landed by one guy were on the arms and shoulders versus clean connections on the other side. But whatever, I get it, but you're not doing that. You're just trying to belittle somebody without any actual evidence, which means you probably can't actually prove what you're doing. I mean, I, I, again, I don't mind disagreements, but... You want to engage in a dialogue? Fine, let's engage in a dialogue. And if all you want to do is just no, this never happened. Like, all right, fine. And I think this is the only time in Vladimir Klitschko's career where he had back-to-back fights with guys he gave up height to. You know what uh, fight was pretty terrible of his? His fight against David Hay. Oh, that had, that was very bad. That had what well, a grudge also, what, a, what a grudge match that was sold to be, and blah blah blah. And David Hay never went in on him. Vladimir kept him at the end of his jab, and David Hay wound up trying to blame it on a broken toe. Yeah. I think afterwards Dana White was like, I don't even know why I watched this. <laughs> well, Dana also had an event the same day, if I'm not mistaken, so he was trying to use that. To- Give or take, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. one of the pay-per-views. All right, here we go, round one. Okay, uh, you can watch actual... Uh, okay. Yeah, Vlad- Klitschko's, Klitschko's jab is so good. <laughs> Vlad immediately sent her the ring to try to dictate... The land battle. And it's very important to a guy like Vlad to get center of the ring. But look at Joshua, not afraid. He's going to make his shots count. Huh. Call Frock nice for providing commentary on this fight. Nice little turn from Joshua there. What is that? Klitschko has more knockouts than Joshua's completed rounds. <laughs> <laughs> that is a hell of a stat, actually. Which kudos to both men for that. <laughs> yeah. And again, you see Klitschko wanting to take the center, control the distance. He knows Joshua is the actual taller, longer fighter, so Vlad wants to dictate where this fight is taking place. It's a sound strategy. Yeah, there's a lot of battle with the lead hand going on from both guys. They're fighting for a punching lanes a little bit. Vlad immediately looked much better in this fight than he did against... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Tyson Fury, where he was just puzzled, confused, and Banks didn't have any answers for him. Joshua obviously fights a much more orthodox style. So in, in that respect, it's almost a little easier to deal with because it's what you're used to. Yeah. The number of people who, especially very traditional fighters, just, even if you're even if the unorthodoxy is kind of stupid, they just don't they just have no idea how to actually deal with it in real time is relatively high. So what I like wow. about this is Klitschko's on his toes. He's really, he's using his footwork. He's bouncing around. You know, it's like I've watched so many fights lately, lately where the guy is, just seems so flat-footed. They're both Vlad, up on their toes. Vlad does the opposite of a Wilder here in that when he gets in closer, the right hand creeps up closer and closer to his chin and cheekbone, especially when he jabs versus Deontay, who just drops it completely. We've seen that right hand of Klitschko pick off two good left hooks from Joshua already. Yeah. His defense thus far is quite sound. I don't think it's a fair nice comparison. Nice right to, to play, the body. To compare the defense of Klitschko to Deontay Wilder, who has no defense. Eh, why not? They're both heavyweights. Boom. Ooh, that left to the body. And that's, nice that's one, of the immediate by Joshua. one of the immediate differences you see from Anthony Joshua versus most heavyweights. Not afraid to throw to the body, knows when to throw to the body. But again, Vlad, you know, he keeps his right hand up and he uses that left hand very similar to George Foreman. Not a push out, but keeps it extended more than he should and it allows him to pick off punches coming in. And it just makes the punching lanes and the angles difficult to navigate. It's one of the reasons they don't like you doing it. Now, you had in that round where Klitschko was the ring general, Joshua was the aggressor, clean effect of punching, not a tremendous amount on either side, I would argue Joshua landed the cleanest punches. Though I don't know that they were any more effective, I would probably edge the round to Anthony Joshua. I'd agree with that. And Joshua trained by Robert McCracken, former super middleweight contender, has done a tremendous job. The corner of Vladimir, Jonathan Banks, ditched Duran, 
and his brother Vitaly. Oh, my feed keeps freezing. Uh, that's on you, man. Uh, yeah. I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah I don't see the picture. No, my, my computer is just really slow. Ah. Uh, ooh, good right by Vladimir. He stepped right in and shot it over the top before Joshua got settled in. And the one thing with Vlad in the Fury fight that preceded this, he just didn't pull the trigger at any point because he was so confused. Here, he's much more active and much more willing, it seems, to engage, which, uh, you know, we'll see how that works out for him. Joshua shoots a right hand short. Well, one of the interesting things I think about Vladimir, and I think this is one of the things that Tyson <coughs> Fury really capitalized on, is uh, Vladimir's timing is, I don't want to say predictable, but he operates on a very kind of consistent rhythm. And disrupting that timing does kind of throw him off a little bit. And it's one of the things Fury did very, very well, was just in the moments when Vladimir was you know, not expecting a punch, not really thinking about it, it, just stuff on the half beat. And yeah, I mean... That's one of the things uh, Joshua is going to start picking up on as this fight goes on. Yeah, the herky-jerky man won a fight between them where neither of them landed more in, than in single digits in any round. Um, again, visibly, it was one of the worst fights you'd ever see, but it was the kind of fight Fury needed to have to win. So I, while it wasn't visually or aesthetically pleasing, I, I get why Fury fought that way. It's what he had to do to win, and he did. And now Joshua is starting to be a little bit more aggressive, stepping in behind his jab. He's not found his range yet. Now, his, a lot of his jabs are falling just a little bit short, and Vladimir's feet, his footwork looks really good. He's very light on his feet. He's in tremendous shape. So good at judging distance. And yeah, Joshua's starting to parry that jab of Klitschko, and I... I mean, that opens up other defensive liabilities, but that goes to show you how good Vladimir's jab is, that he's getting... He's forcing Joshua to adjust to it with his defense. What Joshua's looking to do is play pitch and catch here. He wants to catch Vladimir's jab and come back with one two of his own to capitalize on that distance and find the range for his right hand behind it. You know, these two sparred back, uh, I believe it was about four years before this fight took place for one of Klitschko's training camps. And Joshua said he felt like that was the best experience he ever had. Probably was. Yeah, Joshua's really... It's weird. Half the time he looks... He, he has a really good sense of where he is in the ring, but then he finds himself in a position like this where Klitschko's ring generalship is causing him problems. Yeah, you're not going to find a lot of guys who are better at taking the lead and cutting... And putting a guy where they want them to be than Vladimir, and that's the end of the round. I would argue that Vladimir had a better round there. It was set Yeah, of, I'd go with that. I, it, I'd say we're a round apiece. It was said of Klitschko in one of the uh, previous fights that I did see that there are some who are boxers and some who are punchers. Klitschko is a classic boxer. Yeah, that's very true. Well, you know, Klitschko came out at the tail end of the amateur program where what you call the European style was still predominantly it, where it was very much one-two, one-two, use your distance, use your reach, one-two, one-two, very seldomly throwing hooks, rarely throwing uppercuts, and rarely, if ever, throwing body punches. Um, the new Eastern Bloc style is very much different than that, as you've seen products like Lomachenko, Golovkin, and Kovalev come out of there, and even now Gvodzik, who is the new light heavyweight came in, Another product of that. These guys are very different than that style of fighter. Yeah, I looked up uh, Lomachenko's gold gold medal winning bouts the other night, just kind of on a lark. And good grief, that man is just so many levels above his opposition in both cases. It wasn't; it, they weren't even competitive fights. Now we're seeing a lot. Oh, more here we go with Joshua. Mark, uh, thoughts so far? It's a very technical fight. I mean, you know, this is a, it's funny when I think about what we just saw in the last time we watched the Deontay Wilder fight, what we saw then versus this. I mean, I, I can see why you're so down on Deontay Wilder. Yeah. <laughs> you mean you have eyes? <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm watching these guys do some classic oh. boxing. I mean, they're they're not just winging hooks. 
Um, they're not doing that, that slapping that he does. They're actually trying, you know, looking for openings. Shote, Mark. Shote. Oh, God. Yeah, Joshua's body work is a really interesting component to this because you, know, you talked about Vladimir just coming from a lot of the headhunting school of thought. And it's starting to show a little bit as the fight goes on. The only thing he goes to the body with, I think, is his jab, which occasionally will dip down to the chest. Whereas Joshua, if he, uh, depending on the angle that Vladimir's taking, he'll swing a right to the body as uh, Vlad's exiting the angle. I don't know why, like, Vl- Vladimir Klitschko kind of bounced around the ring. is kind of fun to, to watch. I mean, granted, back a few years ago, he, you know, he his style bored me as a as a viewer. But now, just kind of watching for the technical aspects, I love watching his footwork. The way he the way he shifts his shoulders. There's, 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 so, there's such nuance to his boxing style. It's beautiful. Honestly, this was the best Vladimir Klitschko that had come out in years because he was fighting the best level of opposition he had seen in years. Bit of a push there from Joshua, and his left hook falls a little bit short. Oof, look at that right. And Vladimir took notice of it because he immediately circled in the opposite direction. Yeah. Double jab by Joshua. And now Joshua has been doing more work taking the center of the ring away from Vladimir and making him uncomfortable. Yeah, and as a direct result, you can see any time Vladimir finds himself in a spot he doesn't like, he's lunging forward to clinch and try to reset his position in the ring. Which, in fairness, is not the worst idea in the world. <laughs> God, how did I go through 12 banquets like that? You, you knew you were going to watch a Deontay Wilder fight. Probably right. Yeah, now yeah, now Vladimir's getting back to the center of the ring. Kate, excuse me, ring. He's the one kind of pushing things forward. You said you cleared your evening for this. Did you actually have potentially a hot date tonight or what? I wouldn't say a hot date. More like I could have gone and seen some local bar band or something. Oh. Interesting round. I mean, yeah. that might be a draw round, but I'm leaning a bit towards Joshua. It's hard it's hard to pick one there where there wasn't anything definitive one way or another. I don't know. I think Joshua landed uh more heavy hands in that round than Klitschko did, so I would have to agree that that one goes to Joshua. I, I yeah, like that's a round that I don't disagree with like a 10-10. What we're seeing is a very even keel fight right now where each guy's had their moments doing what they do best. And nobody's really been able to be authoritative one way or another to change the momentum enough to dictate the fight as a whole. I mean, maybe you give that round to Klitschko if you're in favor of a warning around to somebody who makes the other guy miss more often. But like I said, I think Joshua did more damage that round than Klitschko did. You know, ultimately in a round like that, the main component... Oh, is, oh good right. That oh, right wow. from Klitschko. Best punch of the fight, and Joshua is definitely a little bit bothered by that. Yeah, yeah no, his hands immediately went that. up. It comes down to who would you have rather been in that round? And apparently, and, jo- uh, Anthony Joshua worked as a bricklayer before boxing. Yeah, well, look at the physique, look at the work ethic. I'm not surprised. And Joshua very much on the alert now after that solid right hand from Klitschko. Yeah, he's he's being very – he's on full-on, like, counter mode uh, with his defense first at this point. And, and there's his right. But mm. Klitschko's shoulder rolled with that rather nicely, actually. He took a lot of the sting out of that. He did while circling in that direction. It was a good defensive move. Yeah, Joshua's kind of started... Anytime they tie up, Joshua's kind of grabbing over the gloves now. I don't know if he's just trying to prolong it or if he's trying to sap a little bit of the energy from the arms of Klitschko, but... That's what you want to do. You want to try to put weight on the other guy as much as you can, especially as a heavyweight, and just take away what you can. He's, he's David Fields is your referee. David Fields is a big referee. That's why he gets a lot of these heavyweight assignments. You see a double jab from Joshua. He's a hard guy to get the blind side of. I feel like it was the Potemkin fight. Uh, Povetkin, sorry, Povetkin fight with Klitschko, where Klitschko, every other punch was clinching. Yeah, it was. Probably. No, it was, and he got points deducted for it eventually. And then he finally took it to Povetkin late, but... Nice, good right hand. Good right hand of the bike from Joshua. 
catching Klitschko on the exit. Yeah, that's the danger of the shoulder roll is you do really expose your kidneys, and kidney punching is illegal technically, but if you can get on the other side of the ref and you can swing it to the body. It's also not intentional, so good yeah. right-hand counter by yeah. Joshua that time. And he got that one over the top pretty nicely. And he's got a little bit of his confidence back there. Klitschko shoulder roll the right hand well. So and Joshua back goes back post. to the body with the left. So, so funny. Klitschko keeps dropping that left. I mean, he he eventually brings it up where he's anywhere close to being hit, but or uh, when he wants to use it. But I, I would just I every time I watch him do it, it both makes me laugh and frustrates me at the same time. It's like, come on, <laughs> keep your hands up for fuck's sake. Look, there's a viable there's a viable strategy that goes along with having your hand in that position. It, it's like we talked about with his brother, where his brother would lull people into these false senses of security by keeping his hands at waist level, but Vitali was so deceptively quick and put combinations together so well that he could do it and get away with it. Right. And a bit of a left there from And I get Joshua. that. I get the taunting aspect to it. It just as a fan, it's like, all right. <laughs> yeah, you know, knock it off. And, that was Tom, and, and look, man, Tommy Hearns made a career out of having his lead hand that low. I mean, you can go back to the days of Gene Tunney, and Gene Tunney True. carried his hands routinely waist level, but he was such a good boxer and so deft at, you know, making other guys miss that he was able to do it and maintain it. It was a good style for him. Not everybody can do it. And, of course, when you're talking guys who weigh in excess of 250 pounds of solid muscle – it's a little bit riskier than normal. There was a good right hand from uh, Vladimir. Yeah, we get the replay of that right. Yeah, I mean, the only out. guy who the only guy who really made Tunney kind of pay for that style. I mean, apart from the Harry Greb loss, would have been a bit of the the Dempsey rematch. Sure, and he, you know he did catch him along the ropes, got the hands up, dropped him. But you know, of course, even long count aside, Tunney would have gotten up. He just maximized the use of that count as much as he could, yeah. and did All drop right. the following round. Yeah, that was a quick count. Sorry, I might be thinking of a different round from that fight. Ooh, Here we are at five, Roadhouse. Oh, Roadhouse he's coming moves, after it. There we go. Oh, Josh, Joshua's Josh, mad. <laughs> oh, look at the look at the swarming. Round five, and apparently something a switch just went off in Joshua's head. Joshua met Klitschko directly in the oh, center. Oh, that left. Take it. Oh, good. Oh, oh. And down goes Klitschko. Looking, wow. how can you stop that? He was not on a single, bro. So that was a bad MMA joke, but that was a <laughs> hell of a flurry from Joshua. Strategically started off with both men trying to take the center of the ring. Joshua let his hands go first, scored clean, did not let up on what he saw as an opening, kept that same distance, maximized it, dropped Klitschko. Perfect strategy from Joshua. Oh, and there's a big left hook. And he needs to put it, he needs to keep his foot on the gas. He also needs to cut Klitschko off because Klitschko's really, really good at circling. Uh, and yeah, using, jo really Joshua's ring craft when he's flurrying is not terribly impressive. No, I mean, he, he flurries well with the hands, but his footwork in these circumstances is not great. Uh, but like, as I said before, Klitschko is so good at making you miss. Ooh, him. well timed left by Klitschko there. And again, you're talking Klitschko's had more knockouts than Joshua's had rounds. Let's take that into consideration. No. Joshua's clearly a bit hurt by that hook. Good right hand again by Klitschko over the top. Klitschko's gotten him to... <laughs> oh, that was dirty. <laughs> Klitschko Split into a headlock, not... turns it into a left hook. Klitschko yep. not above a little bit of dirty boxing, especially when he's, you know, getting touched. He, uh, that cut on Klitschko? Klitschko. Is that under the eye? It is under the eye, and it looks like Vladimir worked a little bit with Jens Pulver for this fight. <laughs> Love you, Jens. Oh, Good that right left. Hand. Oh, yeah, that, left hand. Klitschko now, felt that one. Now Klitschko's getting... Oh, the uppercut. uppercut. He ducked right into it. Oh, yeah, Joshua's hurt now. Jo Joshua has taken a look over a Queer Street and decided if he wanted to walk down it. And we got another clinch situation. And yeah, Joshua's, Joshua's paying for that flurry at the start of the round right about now. Yeah, with his, he's, with his sucking, gas tank. he's sucking wind. Uh Look at Vladimir really? trying to fight admirably in the clinch, something that's never been his strong suit. Yeah. Doing up the cut inside. I think he'd be better off working inside than tying up, but it's not, again, it's not something he's worked on extensively and feels comfortable with. Good good oh, right hand. That. By the way, that uppercut on the inside was nice. That sliced and diced him right up the middle. Yeah. Another, Another right uppercut. 
Yeah, Joshua's Joshua's guard is a little bit wide with his elbows, and Klitschko's starting to key in on that and come up the middle with that uppercut. Yeah, that's the same. And, and again, you're, you're seeing Klitschko score with punches he's not overly adept with. Klitschko's a one-two type of fighter. Now he's landing uppercuts and left hooks. He's out of his wheelhouse, but he's doing well with it. And when he starts doing well with that stuff, you have to worry about that because now he can go back to what he does best. Especially because Anthony Joshua's had nothing for those uppercuts. Yeah. I mean, he literally ducked right into one. And tall fighters usually make good use of the uppercut. Vladimir is an exception. His brother was exceptional with the lead yeah. hand uppercut. But Vladimir made good use of his rear hand. And this is after being dropped in the same round. I would, I would actually score this a 10-9 round despite the knockdown because of how strong Vladimir came back. I would agree with uh, you. There- yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that too much. Yeah, Joshua just put so much into that flurry in the beginning that come the end of that round, he just had nothing left in his legs or arms to really kind of fight back. <laughs> Took a breath there but when he got up. I mean, it wasn't like a, like a totally like deep breath, you know, or anything, but kind of you can kind of tell like okay, he's like oh. I need to make sure I hold on to my win this time. Remember to breathe. <laughs> breathe, it's stupid. The, breathe. You forgot to breathe again. It's the darndest thing, but there's a reason corners constantly tell their fighters to breathe. Mm-hmm. Because people forget to do it once they start fighting. When I was uh, training in kickboxing and I would get in there and spar, I wasn't trained at that point to breathe appropriately. And I was constantly gasping for air. Because I would, because I would throw exhale a lot when you punch. Of, I would throw a lot of power punches, but it was like I was basically holding my breath. All right, what do we got going uh, on here? Uh, Joshua's Loose mouthpiece tape. fell out. Oh, uh, sorry, mouthpiece. And guys, well, that's that's part of that the reason. You, that's right part of the reason you teach it. kids to key eye. It just gets them used to exhaling, which then makes you inhale. Right. And as I said, if you heard that click, we're at Naren Gasset time. Nice. <laughs> Because we're making a, a fun night of this with another great heavyweight fight. And, again, that round, round that five right? of this fight. Oh. oh! And down goes Joshua. Oh, and that's that was a just delayed reaction. If Vladimir's hitting you with hooks and uppercuts, there's a very good chance he's going to find home for that iron fist, and he did. And Joshua's hurt. He's not all yeah, the way Yeah, he's there. still hurt. That was one that like shocked his nervous system because he kind of just went straight up for a second, then fell on his ass. Yeah, he was I've, he was not in a good spot there. I've been hit with those shots that you have the delayed reaction to. You can't get right for about another thirty seconds after that. It's yeah, it's it's, it's, it's it, terrible. Yeah, your body is in complete non control. No matter what you try to do, everything is on a delay for a good little while. So that's why they tell you. Don't try to fight back. Grab, clinch, do what you have to do. Tie up, knee. hold on, recover. Yeah, I mean, that's when you see people do the, you know, the the chicken dance. That's what that is. Vladimir, the good right hand inside. Oh, nice Other chopping one. right. Now this is the one time where I would tell you the one missing aspect of Vlad's game is his body punching. He would be yeah. so. Uh, look, look at Joshua's feet. Joshua <laughs> is. His legs are gone for the moment. And I get that Vlad's a big guy leaning over him, but to see him stutter around the ring like that, if Vlad would put some body work in, there's a very good chance he could drop him again. Yeah, and instead he's just doing a lot of head hunting, and it's... It's, to me, the one crucial difference between himself and his brother. His brother was not afraid to throw body punches, even if it meant a hit in return. Uh, Vitaly, yeah, Vitaly would tear your ribs to pieces. And again, he's missing wildly over the top, and he's not throwing in combination. He's looking for one big shot to hurt Joshua again. This yeah. was the problem. This was the problem with uh, Tyson Fury. One shot at a time, no combinations because he's he's discouraged when he misses. And yeah, one time, one at a time against Tyson Fury is just a recipe for oh, disaster what a, because what a beautiful right hand. God, that was beautiful. So Pat, we talked earlier about Deontay Wilder doing the uh, the palm strike. I've actually seen both Anthony Joshua and Klitschko do it in this fight. Not like Deontay, not, not like Deontay Wilder, 
who is like a, it's a, like a constant part of his repertoire. But I've actually seen like a couple of times where maybe he was going for a hook or something, but it ended up, he ended up hitting with like the palm of the glove. Well, see, in those instances, a lot of times when you want to pull back on a punch because you don't see the opening there that it was, you'll end up kind of turning your fist outward and tapping with the palm or almost slapping like you talked about earlier. It's more a case of them looking for an opening that's not there anymore and trying to stop it. Mm-hmm. Well, you can't quick. once once you commit to that, especially if you're throwing a power shot, very hard to stop it without actually throwing the full shot. If you try to restrain it and just pull back a little bit on it, but I, I will tell you, it's actually worse to do that than it is just to land the shot on the gloves or the shoulder or what have you. It takes a lot more energy to stop that. All right, on the commentator card, they've got uh, Joshua up by one point over Klitschko, 57-56 here well, they in went round with, they went with the ten eight round. They went with the 10-8 round five for Joshua rather than the 9-8 that we all kind of seem to agree on. Oh, uh, and, and, Josh, and Klitschko clearly had the 10-8 in the sixth. Yeah. So, so for us, I mean, I, I think we all agreed on a 10-9 round in the, the knockdown round initially for Joshua when Klitschko roared back. But the, Klitschko eight, knockdown, yeah. but the Klitschko knockdown round was more a dominant round for Vladimir, so that would be a 10-8 round on our cards. See, I think we'd have actually a Klitschko up a point or a draw. I, I believe it's a draw on our cards right now. Because thus far, we've actually been unanimous on every round, shockingly. And we don't get paid for this, folks. <laughs> Although I will tell you my night has been sponsored by uh, Coors Banquet, because... A hard day deserves an old school hard beer, and uh, Naren Gasset presents Del Shandy, the refreshingly different beer sold on merit. You know, Klitschko keeps sneaking in these little like back fist or hammer fist strikes. He's he's always done that with his left hand. He's always done that, and it's 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 not uncommon among especially heavyweights to do that. But because Vlad is such a heavy ham fisted guy. He knows what he's doing. He's irritating you every time he does it and hurting you a little a little bit when he does it. Not hurting you where he's going to knock you out, but you're feeling it and you're getting discouraged by feeling it. Yeah, Joshua started talking to him this round. Which is uh, pretty bold considering the kid's in his 19th professional fight against the most dominant heavyweight active right now. Uh, it, it's awesome. a lot of balls on, this, on the part of Joshua. I also don't know how good uh, Klitschko's English is. Uh, it's good enough. Good. Bang and Hayden Panettiere. Yeah, Klitschko's, both of them have pretty darn good English at this point. Yeah, Klitschko's jab is again, still kind of just the tail of this round, if nothing else. And Joshua's done very well to just be defensively responsible and kind of cool off and get back into this and slow yeah. Klitschko's momentum. It's a little bit of a left hook there. What was the feedback on this fight from people? Did they did, were they satisfied with the amount of action in the fight, or was this kind of another yawner for people? No, this is anyone who it. complains about this fight is a moron. This was looked at as one of the best heavyweight fights in a long time, and I think you've seen why so far. You, oh, absolutely. you got knockdowns. There is a high level of technique in certain respects with action. It's it's a very satisfying fight on every level so far to me. Yeah, no, I think if you're looking for some classic heavyweight boxing and, you know, technique and whatnot, I think you would be hard-pressed to find another fight better than this <laughs> They one. look, it's Deontay Wilder. <laughs> who's they, about to... They who, put this go- idiot on commentary? To, well, look, the theory was he was going to fight the winner. But yeah. because Deontay Wilder will never fight anyone who's any good... That never actually came to fruition. But the thought was, yeah, he'll fight the winner of this fight in the big heavyweight unification bout. And then he sees what is about to happen over the next few rounds and decides, you know what, no thanks. <laughs> He's basically, I can't beat either of these guys. Well, I should stay away, clearly. I mean, you couldn't even really beat Tyson Fury. And then he, again, had to like pay off with some judges for that decision. And, and again, Mark and I did the commentary on that fight. We gave Wilder, what, three rounds? Yeah. You were generous. It was much later in the fight when Tyson started to slow down. It and was... here we Vladimir opening up. Coming forward, another clinch. 
Vladimir is 12 and 1 with 7 KOs against unbeaten opposition. The only one would be his loss to Tyson Fury. Bit of a left hook from Joshua there. Joshua seems to have caught his second wind here finally. It's a funny thing about getting knocked down and not getting finished immediately after. There's this sense of boldness in you that emerges and you feel like this guy couldn't pull the trigger and finish me. I can come back and win this. Especially when you've already dropped him. Yeah, Joshua avoids a right hand there, starting to get his jab going again. Nice left and hook there from Joshua into the clinch. Immediately, Vlad's response is to tie up on the inside. Vlad does not want to fight on the inside, it appears, at this point. No, he. I think Vlad knows his best chances of winning this fight is at distance, especially if he can get really long distance. And he tries he wants that to be, right hand again. He wants to be all the way out or all the way in. I mean, because any middle distance seems to be Joshua's... I mean, Joshua's punching power is fairly tremendous. I mean, look at the size of that man's shoulders. And remember, he's also 6'6", with like a 77-inch reach. Now Vlad's backing him up again with that jab. Fainting. But Vlad, Vlad's not up on his toes like he was. There's no, definitely he's, some wear and tear there. He's flatter, for sure. He's all, His yeah, left eye also is all messed up. There's a lot of Vaseline hanging off of that, that more than... It is accumulated damage. Swelling, though. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm surprised Joshua hasn't gone back to it more, quite frankly, because well, there's a giant target there. Ooh, him, nice ooh. right from Vlad. For him to throw that right hand, he's going to have to put himself in line for Vlad's right hand, and I think at this distance he wants to avoid that. Maybe in close he'll look for it, but Vlad's yeah. right hand at distance is what got him in trouble in the first place, so he's going to yeah, be he, respectful of that punch. He's going to look for middle distance engagements more than you know long-range Boy, Joshua's getting a little bit off balance with his jab, putting a lot more weight onto his front leg. He's loading up. He wants to take advantage. He wants to score inside hard with that lead hand and set something up for later. He wants to get that initial shot off on Vlad to get his respect. But now Vlad pushing back with the jab now. Now he's a little more mobile. Now he's a little more up. Guy, but... his jab is so good. <laughs> look, at, look at Joshua. Push forward with his jab. Take the center away. That's impressive. Yeah, it's a last-minute last, last minute statement in that round to go, you know, I'm still here and I'm still, I'm not going away. We are moving into round nine, I believe. And Hayden there we Paul see Pierre Hayden Penetair, who is, mar uh, they were, uh, they've, they're married since, I believe, but at the time they were just engaged. Yeah, she's a sweetheart of a gal, too. I've never met her. I couldn't comment. Met her and Vlad together. Tremendous people. I, I have not mean, seen her in oh. anything since she was in one of the Scream movies. God, that is a Gross. gnarly cut. Well, I just got a good look fight, at that cut on Klitschko, and that's in a bad spot. It is, but he's got one of the premier cut men in his corner. And that is Stitch. They are doing a good job of not allowing Joshua to exploit it thus far. Yeah. So you put that adrenaline on it, let it kick in, let it do its work, and there's a chance that cut will not play into this. David Fields causing both men to break, and now we'll fight. Klitschko right coming out, out aggressively this round, and Joshua with some rib roasters there in close. A two, Vlad, club, two clubbing rights starting off this round from Klitschko. Vlad does not look composed. Vlad looks a little bit uh, desperate at this point. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't know if he feels his own cardio going or whatnot, but he looks – he's uh, he's antsy. He, I believe in the corner, Vitali said he's not like a man. He's like a piece of iron. <laughs> uh, Kalfrock has a 76 to 75 for Klitschko. Uh, I think I think our scores would have Klitschko up another point. Yeah, I could see one point for either guy as being fair, or draw being fair. This has been a pretty even kill fight with a lot of good stuff going on. Vlad misses over the top with that right hand. Yeah, you can see Klitschko. I don't know. He's anxious in this round, and Joshua is starting to slip and counter to the body quite well. Oh, good jab inside by Klitschko as Joshua getting in right hand over the top. Yeah, nice stuff from Klitschko there in close. Joshua tucks one into the body there while they're all clinched up. But again, yes. I think Vlad doing good work in the clinch, even though he's not comfortable with it. I think it's something he should look to more. He's falling short with his punches at distance. Work in the clinch because you've done well with it. 
good left counter left from Joshua. Yeah, it just got picked off by the forearm, but it was good. It was a good punch. Caused Vlad to have to reset and back out. And it got him moving. It got him out of the corner. I can uh, see why Deontay Wilder would not want to fight Klitschko. He get killed. Oh, good right from Joshua and close. I mean, either of these guys would just run him over. I mean, let's let's be honest. What we saw from Deontay Wilder tonight versus what we're seeing from both of these guys, this is a definitive, definitive gap in talent. Sure. I mean, you've got Klitschko, who who's a premier boxer, a very technical boxer, and Deontay Wilder, who's a tough man fighter. He'd get picked apart. Now, I mean, maybe he gets knocked out, maybe he doesn't. But he would definitely lose. I would probably. I mean, unless he knocks Klitschko down, I, I don't think that he gets around. I, mean, I don't. Tyson think, Fury I don't barely think he's gave him after a the round. fourth round. I don't think he's live in that fight after the fourth round. No, because Klitschko pushes oh. him much, or Joshua. They push a much better pace than Fury does. Body shots that Joshua threw on the side there. Joshua's body work, man, is that's hurting me just watching. <laughs> like he, he's digging. He's digging to those ribs. Your ribs hurt, Winfrey. Actually, my lower back hurts. I did something to it today. So, yeah, beating that bull. And that's a definitive Joshua round for me. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Stitch going right to work on that cut again, but to his credit, Vladimir did not let the cut get hit or pretty. Pretty well touched in that round. No, he's been very defensively mindful of that of the cut in particular, and Joshua hasn't. I don't know if it's just Joshua not being able to or just not realizing that <laughs> that option about, is there. Talking about great heavyweights, here we see at ringside Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis, two of the greats, two of the bastions of the last great era of heavyweights. <laughs> God, yeah, those two. I honestly think Tyson's line about Evander is probably the best. And even if, even if you don't consider Evander Holyfield the best ever, if you look at a lot of people that uh, that you know people do consider the best ever, Evander makes a lot of them look silly when they fight. I'm sure Gavin Napier would agree with that, since Gavin Napier worships at the Temple of Holyfield. I don't worship at the Temple of Holyfield, but I think it's a very fair point about Evander and his abilities. All right, we are in round ten here. Two more rounds well, Ma- to go after this. Mark, who are you favoring right now? Uh, Klitschko. Is there, Josh- anything, is there anything you think that Klitschko could be doing that he's not to really seal this fight up? Um, well, I, I agree with you. I think he needs to do a little... I think he needs to be working inside. Uh, I think he needs to... I left Maybe. the body. See, when they clinch like that, he's just holding. What he needs to do is he needs to be punching at that time. He needs Pretty to be good counter right there. In. Yeah, the rule is if you're in a clinch and you have one hand free, you are absolutely allowed to fight with that hand. Right, so there was his right hand right there that he could have been using to put some hooks into the body or you know, even to the head, you know, kind of touch him, stand back, let, let, your, let your hand go. But he's just holding him. Yeah. It's a pretty the lack of Klitsch sophistication was always kind of a big knock on Vit- on uh, Klitschko. And, and again, nice it's, that, it's that system he came out of that discourages that type of fighting. Well, the amateurs discourage clinching generally, and again, and, his and, style in particular. And on top of that, who he trained with, Emmanuel Stewart, does not particularly favor his guys to be fighting in that area. Man, those those body shots from Joshua, man. He's swinging that right to the body. He's pretty clearly setting up the right to the head uh, by see, showing that look. I don't see any heavyweight who works to the body the way Anthony Joshua does. Not who's any good. Well, he's back on his toes again. At least he was. And Klitschko now, going for the guillotine. Now you see Klitschko <laughs> throwing a, at least something underneath. That's what yeah. he needed to be doing, like Mark pointed out. Commentary. I think it was somebody on commentary just said, "Yeah, you want to do that when the ref can't see that." I think it was Wilder. Yeah, yeah well, Vlad's got his bounce page. back in his step, but uh, and he, oh, okay, good. He restraint. thought about it. But, he, yeah, he thought about a rabbit punch there, and he could have he could have landed a good one. 
But the ref was right there and would have called him on it. Yeah, the rabbit punches are hard when you're a heavyweight. The kidney shots, the hip shots, not so much. The rabbit punches, yeah, they're going to see that. couple of rights there to the body and close from Joshua. Yeah, he's, I, breaking, I, he's breaking down the posture of Klitschko with those body shots. And it's still pretty good, but ooh, oh, good that was right. ugly. <laughs> you see Vlad a lot more hunched over than he usually is, leaning in. Yeah, he's worried about his ribs. Uh, good yeah, right from... Good right from Klitschko there at the end. I'd still kind of give that round to Joshua, actually. I but. think it's a difficult round to score. And again, for me, it comes down to the the aspect of who would I have rather been in that round? I'd rather well, Klitschko. Just... And I'd rather been Joshua. But yeah, that's that, that's a close round. And that, that uh, you know, I don't agree with everything or anything Max Kellerman says, but that's the one thing I think he's always gotten right on commentary is that if you get into a round where you have a very hard time, oh, pull, that four, yeah. that was a forearm from Klitschko, the way Joshua leaned into it, that was gnarly. And he caught glove and forearm there. That was yeah, a that that is an unhappy punch to eat. Oh. <sighs> But I think the one thing Kellerman has consistently been right about is when you do get into that close round where you have a hard time scoring it, pick who you'd have rather been in that oh, round. Oh, that right from Joshua. Joshua with the right hand over the top. And, and Vlad is left. Hurt. Vlad is hurt. Left hand, Vlad is, Vlad's legs are not there. He not there at all. Up. And he Joshua stalking up. him a little bit. Again to the body. Good body work when the guy's hurt. And Solid fundamental. That's the difference between when Klitschko had Joshua hurt and now. Joshua's willing to go to his body. He's stalking, going down, going up. There's some pretty nice defensive movement there from Klitschko, considering he's still a little wobbled to have his legs still under him like that. He's shuffling with the punches. He's moving his head, moving his upper body, moving his chest. And Joshua now kind of cooling off, letting him off the hook a little bit, or so we think. Yeah. Vlad is not all the way back yet. He's not attacking, which should let you know that he's not really back in the saddle. That was that a left going. hook and oh, close. Oh, my God. Look at that. That was a wicked left and close. That was. I'm impressed with Klitschko's ability to, you know. He, uh, Klitschko's chin is pretty underappreciated. Yeah, I was going to say, he's taking some hard shots. Oh, from that Joshua. uppercut. Oh, Jesus Christ. That was another one. <laughs> That one's going to Butch eat. goes on Queer Street. Down he goes. Yeah, I was going to say, he's going to need to see his chiropractor on that one. His fucking head got knocked loose. Vladimir is in a lot of trouble. He right? is on, like, he, he's rounding the block on Queer Street. He is not in a good his spot. Legs are crossing as he walks forward to David Fields. I don't, I might have stopped that. I'm, right I'm with you, man. I might have stopped the way he was w moving. I don't like Joshua the way. With a right. I don't like the way his head moved when he got hit by that. I mean, that looked like. It like a long wobbled. Fence. Boom, boom, boom. Down he oh, goes fuck. again. Yeah, you it stop. Wow. And they're going to let this go? Hang on. I can't remember if this is the final. Oh, Klitschko says he's okay. Wow. Uh, I've seen, yeah. I've he's seen gonna, fights when you get knocked going. down twice like that in a fight and you look that out of it. They stop the fight. Well, he he's, 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 still he's still engaging with the field. ref. He kind of walks sideways to David Fields. Yeah. <laughs> And Joshua, Joshua is not going to let him off the hook this time. No, you got to better Josh, job of him off the, in the corner you, you and press. body head, body head. One, two, three. That's it. There you go. Okay, now we're stopping it. Wow, with one round to spare. Good for you, Anthony Joshua. And yeah, you wonder why Deontay Wilder's ducking this guy? No, <laughs> <laughs> not wondering at all. Why do you ask? All right. So what was that? A TKO? Okay. Yeah. That was a TKO in round 11. All Standing right. TKO. He was down on the official scorecards, I think. Yeah, hey, I would probably say so. All right, well, that was fun. Uh, we, we definitely made a night of it. I think it's time to call it a night. Uh, this week, a slight uh, schedule change due to some personal issues going on with uh, Jesse, the host of Source Material. We will be doing a live, live Source Material hosted by me. And we'll be talking World War Hulk with Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey. Uh, so that'll Terrible be fun. Luck. <laughs> it's good. Uh, it's I've, really not. It's a pretty terrible arc. 
Like, I'm not saying that to be ironic or just to tweak your nipples. I right. have a feeling, Mark, that you will enjoy the fight between the Hulk and the Sentry. I've read it. It's one of the ones I've already read. I, it's one of the why, why it ended up on here. I loved World War Hulk. Um, uh, I love that, that. I love that whole run, starting with Planet Hulk, going all the way through World War Hulk. Um, anyway, I mean, I like the Sentry just kind of as a. I say that to annoy people because everyone hates him. Because <laughs> in so many ways he's terrible, almost as bad as the Hulk as a character. Speaking of declaring a world war on somebody, John Wick three Parabellum, uh, damn you Hollywood this week. Uh, Jesse will be back Wednesday for Metal Hammer of Doom. We'll be reviewing the new Elevidi, which uh, check it out because there's a song on there that is hot fucking fire, man. It is awesome. So check out the new Elevidi. Uh, and then I'm finally caught up on all both John Wick movies. We'll talk about it on Long Road to Ruin this Thursday, myself and Sean Comer. And then... Uh, Look, everything you need to know about Mark's personal taste in movies, he likes Transformers <laughs> and didn't like John Wick. Why? Well, I didn't like it. I just, it was, you know, it was whatever. You heard, Mark. look, you heard me. <laughs> Mark, seriously? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I, I don't want to have this conversation now. Look, you and I are going to get into it when it comes on, on Tuesday, and I'm fine with delaying. The, I'm fine with delaying the actual discussion until that point. I just have yeah, to put I'm it out there. Say, Robert, you speak for all of us. Yeah. No, One of the are... few times I will be in the majority position. Yeah, when it you comes really to will. Talking about there movies. were there were people on my Facebook feed going, "Wait a minute, you don't love John Wick?" And I'm like, "Nah, it's not my thing." And and the people were like, "But but but but, but why?" Well, so, Mark, you had a dog, didn't you? <laughs> Nobody killed my dog, Pat. Um, That's not the point. <laughs> we'll talk about it Tuesday. Um, speaking of, <laughs> but if you enjoyed this this show and you enjoy the. Uh, the work here from the three of us. We'll all be back together again for a TV party tonight on Friday to discuss the Zac Efron and Jim Parsons Ted Bundy movie. Jim Parsons of that wonderful show that has just ended, The Big Bang Theory, which had the perfect finale. Don't bother with Game of Thrones. Watch The Big Bang Theory. It'll ultimately, ultimately be more satisfied. Okay, uh, I'm just going uh, uh, to put this out there. No, I'm just going to put this out there. Mark, you've watched The Big Bang Theory. I have not. One of us has cancer. I'm not saying it's the... <laughs> you all can decide. That's not how causation works, but that's fine. Uh, I also watched Big Bang Theory for a number of years, but I gave up when it was stale and awful and repetitive, and I also do not have cancer, but I do have alcoholism. There you go. Yeah, so you can be Mark or Pat, or you can just have never actually watched the stupid obnoxious, reprehensibly unfunny cash grab that was the Big Bang Theory, and you can be me. Yeah. Picture of help. Apart from I pulled back. So May 25th is AEW Double or Nothing. We will review it the next day, Sunday, 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 uh, May 26th. And then uh, Jesse, Jesse will be hosting the Source Material podcast on the Memorial Day. We'll be ending Marvel Event May with the show, with the uh, crossover Blood Ties. Uh, I won't be on that show, but uh, Jesse did a great job with it. Uh, you can hear that show once it airs on Memorial Day. And then we close out Damn You Hollywood for May with Aladdin. The new Sworn Enemy will be reviewed on May 29th. And speaking of Game of Thrones, myself, and now see, I changed the, I changed it, so this won't set off the my Amazon Echo anymore. Alexis Haina will be uh, coming on to a TV party tonight to discuss Game of Thrones, and you better believe we'll probably be discussing the stupid petition. Uh, and then June first, the day before my birthday, the aforementioned Anthony Joshua versus Andrew Ruiz Jr., myself and Pat. We'll be providing commentary, and I think so will you. I think we agreed that you'd be done with with your fight from Sweden. Ikea is from Sweden. I like meatballs. My bum is on the Swedish. Swedish. Um, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, that's Gustafsson versus Smith. So you should be done and able to watch that show by then. Uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, again, I don't know what the start time is for that. They haven't announced it yet. It's 1 o'clock, it says. I was going to say, probably 1 o'clock p.m. It'll end by like 3 or 4 o'clock p.m. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah, if it's 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 11 here. So it yeah, is. I'm fine. looking at way, it. Okay, Ikea, fine. Ikea frozen yogurt and pretzels, fantastic. 
Outstanding. All right. How the world was? Ah, oh, never mind. Our sorry, just the UFC. I just looked at the UFC's performance of the night. Their their bonuses for the event tonight, and the fight of the night was Aspen Ladd versus Sajari Eubanks, and wasn't a bad fight, but I don't know. It it just kind of speaks to the the lower quality of this card, and did, the fact uh, that did Dominic Brazil get a performance bonus? Uh no, it was Aspen. <laughs> Look. They can't actually disclose the bonus they gave to Dominic Brazil without opening themselves up to litigation. So, By the way, no. is that Nate Diaz that's in John Wick 1? I'd have to rewatch it. I believe it's Nick. No, it's not. definitely not Nick. No, it's not Nick. Um, hang on. No, I'm looking, you, know, you do plugs. I'll look it up. Do your plugs. Plugs. All right, all, all right, jeez. Plugs. No, it's not Nate Diaz. I'm convinced that guy looked just like Nate Diaz. It is not him. I just looked. No, but uh, Tate Fletcher and I think um, Keith Jardine. Keith Jardine are both in it. Yes. Jardine's one of the guys with a beard. Keanu uh, grabs him by the beard and then slams his face into the table and then shoots him in the body several times. Cameron yes, Nash is in it. That, that, that was a pretty fun uh, thing. And they also have a uh, coffee business together. Yeah, when are they getting married? Uh, as soon as Colorado legalizes that, I assume. Uh, I actually don't know if uh, about either of their sexual orientations. P-L-U-G, for the record. P-L-U-G, P-L-U-G, plugs, plugs, plugs. <laughs> All right, uh, I just wrapped up before starting this nonsense, my coverage of UFC on ESPN t- plus 10. Um, this is kind of what this is. This is what happens when you book a lot of mismatches on a card. Uh, there were a lot of finishes. A lot of them were decent, but un- but largely unmemorable, unremarkable. Uh, there were a couple of really good ones. Um, Michelle Pereja, who is very famous for doing an honest to god lie insult in the middle of an actual fight. <laughs> This is, you think I'm joking. This is not a joke. He knocks the guy down and decides the best thing to do is to jump onto, like, halfway up the cage, put his hands on the top, and then backflip onto his opponent. Actual was, thing he did. How is that not the best thing to do? I mean, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying. That's that's not a joke. Like this, He had a pretty memorable uh, debut, knockout with a flying knee and a punch. Um. Vicente Luque had a pretty decent fight. Uh, you know, Rafael dos Anjos won. Um, again, it was it, there was some decent stuff, but in the end of the at the end of the day, it's probably going to wind up as you know what that was pretty good, but I'm not going to remember almost anything from it. So then uh, that's it. We're going to review that and then talk about all the major news of the week. And I will continue to complain that Tony Ferguson versus Donald Cerrone is not a five round fight because what is wrong with you? Give those two maniacs five rounds. I mean, I don't, I don't think Tony Ferguson will need all three rounds to get the win, but just the principle. Uh, so anyway, we'll talk about all the news of the week, and that's it. Again, the week after that, we will have a preview for Gustafson versus Smith, which is... I hate this card. I hate this card so, so much. There are four light heavyweight fights on this card, and three of them are the top three fights. I didn't know there were eight light heavyweights in the UFC. Yeah, yeah, there are. There's more than Just eight. Go ahead and get yourself a tall glass of turnip juice. Ugh, because it was haunted. Uh, in that it, haunted lemon tree back to Springfield. Darn right. Uh, in all seriousness, the main event is okay. It's Alexander Gustafson and Anthony Smith. That has some potential, but. Okay, and I'm I'm loosely interested in Alexander Rakich and Jimmy Manoa just because I'm kind of high on Rakich, but... I mean, Uzdemir and Latifi does nothing for me. Darko Stasic and Devin Clark does nothing for me. And frankly, I expect at least one of those other two heavyweight fights that I'm loosely interested in to kind of suck. Uh, good God, Tanya Avenger's fighting. How's your Why? How's your podcast doing since you've moved it from my network to 411? I don't know. I don't <laughs> no, seriously, I don't really look at numbers. I don't care. I mean, I looked at that other one just kind of on the spur of the moment thing, and just oh hey, look at that number. Uh, you know, about the same I think on the old network as on the new network as the old. So 
Okay. Well, anyway, we'll have a... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Robert. Go ahead. So anyway, that's what we'll be doing. I will be Tuesday hosting Damn You Hollywood, where I will laugh at Mark for being the the plebeian unsophisticate that he is for disliking John Wick. I will also lament the fact that Halle Berry does not get shot in the face by Keanu Reeves, and I don't mean that sexually. I mean I wanted him to kill her. I mean it in both ways. I haven't seen it yet. I'm seeing it tomorrow. I haven't seen it yet either. One of my brothers did, and the only thing I asked was, does he actually, does Halle Berry double cross him and he gets to shoot her in the face? And he said no, and I went, damn. Spoilers. Oh, no. <laughs> Whatever will we do? Yeah, come on. Like, anybody listening to this hasn't already, you know, looked at the plot, you know, on Wikipedia. I haven't done that. I just... Again, it's like, a, I, It's a John Wick movie. I'm pretty sure it doesn't have a plot. I'm pretty sure this is our generation's version of Death Wish, and I'm fine with it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go along with that. I, I'll go along with that, yeah. And I'm completely okay with it. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I I just I love the the action sequences in those movies. It's one of the most pure adaptations of martial arts to and implementing legitimate deadly weaponry that you will ever see. Which I get that's the attraction, and if that's the kind of thing you like, that's great. It's not my thing, as I said. When I when you know when I see somebody killing you know this many people in a movie, I usually like it to be a monster, not a guy. Not, he not, is a monster. Did you know yeah, that? He, he is a monster. Yeah, he's Look the Ted Bundy. Baba Yaga. What was it? Baba Yaga? Baba Yaga? Baba Yaga. Yeah, but no, no, Baba no. Baba O'Reilly. You're not a fa- I'm not a fan of well-choreographed action, but God, but I'm going to scream at Robert for 30 minutes when he suggests cutting Stanley Tucci not being able to get rid of a bomb. Yeah. <laughs> look, at, look at how many bodies Ted Bundy was able to get rid of. Just saying. All right. This, we'll, we'll deal with this on Tuesday. Right. So, uh, moving forward, uh, as you've heard... The three of us will get together again this coming Friday to review the Netflix original film on the aforementioned Ted Bundy, uh, Shockingly Evil, Vile, and Extremely Wicked. I think that title is a lot of words, too many for my it's liking. A, look, they should have just ha- kept that title and then subtitled it The True Story of Zac Efron. Yeah, that's about right. So you'll hear the three of us do that. As well as Saturday, June 1st, you will hear Mark and myself uh, hopefully Robert joining us as well after the card from Sweden uh, ends. We're talking Anthony Joshua versus Andy Ruiz Jr. Originally supposed to be Jarrell Miller, unfortunately got hurt and pulled out. So we will get to watch uh, Anthony Joshua defend his belts anyway. Uh, also, uh, yeah, good for Anthony Joshua not just canceling the fight. Uh, since there's going to be uh, some shuffling happening around on the Rattles Broadcasting Network, I'm going to make myself available as needed for whatever shows may come, uh, be it Metal Hammer of Doom, be it Long Road to Ruin, what have you. I will try to uh, keep the network up, keep the ratings up, because that's what I do. Uh, I will be happy to do it. Uh, so if you do uh, want to keep up with what we're doing, you can follow us on Facebook. I will gladly post schedules. Uh, of what is going on and what will be expected to come in the near future. But as of right now, those are two guaranteed gigs where I will be talking Ted Bundy and I will be talking Anthony Joshua. It will be interesting to see who ends up with a higher body count. (laughs) All right, folks. Thank you again for joining us on uh, this, this damn, nope, this TV party tonight, extra boxing commentary. And uh, we hope to offend you at some point in the future. Have a good night.